Good morning, everyone. Professor Ozawa, are you there? Are you listening to me? Ah, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yes, okay. perfect. Thank you. Welcome, Professor Ozawa. I want to introduce to you the organizing committee. I'm Brian Grajales, Duan eh, Cardona. Jessica Gonzalez. Thank you. Eh, we have Karina Gonzalez and Milton Aguirre. We, we are glad to, to have you here. Oh, thank you. Can you share your screen now? Uh, this is my screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's nice. So uh, before you, be, you begin, uh, we prepared a, a, a speech, a little speech for you. So in two minutes, we are going to give that speech and then you can start, okay? Okay. Okay, I think we can start. Um, can the par participants can see the, the screen of Professor Osawa in the whole screen? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone. We start this third day of conferences with the presence of Professor Toru Osawa, whom I'm pleased to introduce you this morning or night or after, that depends on where you are. Professor Osawa is a recognized analyst and focuses his current research on the study of nonlinear Schrodinger and hyperbolic equations and functions spaces. He began his professional career at Waseda University under the supervision of Professor Masayoshi Tsutsumi to continue his master's and doctoral studies at Kyoto University under the direction of Professor Shigetahe Matsura. Since then, his career as a, as a researcher has been on the rise. He has published more than 170 papers in different international and important journals, supervised eight doctoral theses, has been a reviewer for the American Mathematical Society since 1992. He was chair of the Japanese National Committee of the International Mathematical Union and was awarded the Furukawa Sensu Prize for Physics in 1984 and the Mathematical Society of Japan Spring Prize in 1998. Currently, Toru Osawa is a professor in the Department of Applied Physics at Waseda University. He's the chair of the Mathematical Sciences Committee of the Science Council of Japan and a member of the digital board in eight international journals. Today, Professor Orsawa will present us his talk entitled Method of Modified Energy. I feel very happy and honored with your presence at this event, and I hope you feel welcomed by us. This space is yours, so now you can start your talk. 
Thank you for the invitation, as well as for uh, the introduction. Uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, this is Toru Ozawa. It is my pleasure and honor uh, to give a talk in this international conference. I would like to thank the organizers and the scientific committee members for giving me this uh, occasion. Uh, today, I will speak on the method of modified energy. The outline of my talk is as follows. First, we uh, uh, explain basic idea of Brice and Galoué, uh, famous paper published in Nonlinear Analysis in 1980. 1980. And I'll uh, introduce uh, a modified energy method and its uh, uh, effect on the improvement. And uh, uh, then I will uh, uh, introduce uh, some other applications uh, for uh, uh, introducing some other uh, partial differential equations. And then uh, uh, lastly, the uh, conclusion. So uh, let me start with uh, the problem. Now, uh, omega is a uh, domain with uh, sufficiently regular uh, boundary. Uh, we don't assume the boundedness, boundedness of the domain. And the equation is as follows. I the T U plus Laplace U is modulus U squared in U. Namely, uh, the ordinary uh, cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And we restrict restrict our attention to, uh, for positive times. And uh, uh, the boundary condition is uh, zero. zero. And initial condition is given by uh, function of on uh, omega. Uh, this is our uh, set of uh, uh, equations. And uh, here, uh, we regard this Laplacian as a self adjoint operator in L2 of omega with domain H2 intersect in H0. The standard sobor space of order two and order one with vanishing uh, boundary condition. So if you, if we regard this Laplacian as a sequential uh, operator with domain here, then the, the boundary condition is automatically satisfied as far as u of t belongs to this domain. And uh, uh, 
here is the standard uh, integral form of this uh, equation u of t minus s u squared u s v s. Here, capital U is a free, free propagator of uh, Laplacian. Uh, this has a meaning as a, a unitary group generated by the self joint operator. And uh, the basic fact is the uh, uh, existence of of maximal maximal strong solutions uh, solutions. Uh, in the original paper of uh, Bridges and Galloway, uh, they uh, re uh, refer this uh, uh, lemma uh, proportion as uh, I have been seagulls. I've been seagulls. Uh, the content is as follows. For any T in domain, there exists a unique uh, solution of uh, in the maximum time interval with domain and uh, here is a solution uh, of this integral equation. And then uh, either uh, one, T M is infinity or this maximum time existence time is finite and the limit. of uh, is two norm, uh, L2 norm up to the second order uh, diverges. And uh, the main theorem of this Galway is that uh, uh, we uh, chose a uh, positive sign for uh, simply uh, to just uh, to simplify the uh, presentation. And in this case, uh, this nonlinear Schrodinger equation has the global solutions. Uh, this is uh, their main result. And uh, here uh, we need to uh, bound, a priori bound of H2 norm. That's what uh, 
they did. So uh, let me uh, uh, let me specify the uh, class of solutions. Uh, we we uh, distinguish weak and strong solutions. A weak solutions are uh, weak. Uh, uh, with values in, in L2 or H1. And a strong solution is uh, with values in, in H2. And uh, uh, a priori control of L2 and H1 is uh, directly related to a charge and energy. And uh, uh, its uh, corresponding transformation is gauge transformation. Uh, it means u and e i theta u. The, sim the simplest gauge transformation. And the energy is a time translation. Uh, with t minus Theta. Yeah, theta is uh, uh, parameter, and this dot means uh, time time uh, variable, and the corresponding generator is just uh, uh, differentiation of u in theta at theta is zero. So uh, for H2 control, is uh, obtained by uh, IU. Uh, this notation is uh, a scalar product in L2. Du minus uh, plus Laplace U minus U squared U. Uh, this is uh, zero because the right hand side is zero. And this and uh, potential so vanishes uh, due to uh, uh, the sign condition. And uh, this is equal to one over half d t squared, squared. So, uh, the two law is preserved and controlled. And H1 control is uh, given by Du du plus a plus u minus u squared u, and this is equal to uh, this term vanishes, and this term after uh, one integration by parts, this gives you. Uh, One two d d t uh, nabla u squared uh, plus uh, uh, one over two u and four now of four and if you if we Define 
this term as the energy, then here is the energy conservation. And uh, L2 over, over U is bounded by uh, the energy at uh, zero, and the L4 norm at the, the uh, of uh, initial function, initial theta phi, is bounded by uh, uh, H1 norm of the initial data. So uh, up to L2 and H1, uh, completely uh, the norms are controlled. And so the problem is H2 control. Uh, we have controlled a uh, two norm. So uh, uh, we are left with a control of Laplacian of U. Uh, the original uh, treatment of Bridges and Garue is uh, just uh, apply Laplacian on both sides of the in integral equation and then take a two norm. And uh, Laplacian and the unitary group capital U of T commute. And so this method simply gives you the integral. Uh, inequality is. And here, Laplace uh, of uh, the modulus squared u of u is just simply calculated as follows gradient u squared dot uh, gradient u plus uh, modulus u squared or plus u. And again, this part is calculated like this uh, to number u squared. So we have uh, two types uh, of nonlinearity. One is uh, the terms with Laplacian, and the other is terms without uh, Laplacian. So, uh, uh, this is bounded by, uh, we have three u infinity squared number u plus, uh, here is four and two, and uh, we are left with u infinity number u squared, ah, and four. Right. And then uh, this uh, four norm, is bounded by constant times use infinity plus u. And then uh, we have 
this time is whose time is bounded by uh, an infinity uh, norm of square and the Laplace u. And here uh, we use uh, the so called bridge Galway inequality, and it is bounded by one plus h1 uh, log uh, one plus uh, u uh, plus u squared. And uh, this uh, squared uh, effective norm with uh, with Galway inequality implies uh, this bound. And then uh, we get uh, integral uh, inequality with logarithmic terms uh, on Laplace U in L2. And this growth, logarithmic growth, uh, uh, shows you the bound double exponential bound with some constant uh, depending only uh, on a, uh, H1 norm of solutions. And another use of race Galway inequality shows you uh, exponential bound like this. Now, uh, this argument does not use uh, inner product. We used uh, inner product uh, of uh, L2 and uh, uh, H1, but here, uh, uh, scalar product has not been used. So uh, let me introduce some calculus, including uh, scalar product. Let me uh, uh, calculate like this. Here we start uh, a rather formal uh, uh, calculus. And this is your part of dt plus u. And uh, if you uh, to your part dt plus u plus u, and uh, we use the equation on the right member, and I dt minus u squared u and uh, this part vanishes and we are left with two real part uh, dt plus u u squared u okay uh, and this uh, uh, the last uh, term uh, has 
one time derivative and uh, we move this uh, time derivative or we uh, uh, we use Leibniz rule uh, to be more precise, transpose Leibniz rule in, in this factor dt to your part plus u u squared u uh, minus uh, plus uh, two uh, part uh, value uh, dt u squared u minus two uh, part across uh, u u squared you okay so the time derivative uh, is on the right members okay ah this is on this is plus plus uh, this is minus. Okay. And so uh, this is plus, and this is minus, and this is minus. Okay. And uh, this is a company, sorry. And uh, this term minus two. Your part, uh, Laplace U, uh, DT U squared U is written as to your part. To your part, U bar Laplace U and DT U. Squared, and this is equal to uh, plus u squared minus two nabla u squared du, and uh, another uh, uh, integration by part, then uh, this gives you d dt nabla d squared squared plus two uh, nabla u squared uh, okay, u squared. Okay, and this, uh, the last factor is calculated like uh, uh, two imaginary part u bar i dt u and the imaginary part u bar uh, minus Laplace u plus And this is the potential term vanishes and uh, taking complex conjugate, uh, this is equal to this one. So we replace this term as uh, 
four times the imaginary part of Nabla uh, Nabla uh, u squared. U and Laplace U, right? So, uh, so this term next, and uh, okay. So uh, the second term on the right, right hand side is. Uh, written like this. And the minus the last sum, uh, that plus uh, u squared is adequate. Right? At this time, uh, we use the equation on the left. Remember, plus v and minus plus v squared u, v squared v delta u. And then this is uh, two root by just of four and dt squared. And uh, no, no, uh, okay. So this is uh, calculated as dt. Mm -hmm. Is six uh, six no is in the so we write the result here d d t u uh, six no and uh, yes it is now here uh, in the here we have uh, the time derivative of uh, apparently indefinite uh, scalar product. So we look at uh, the minus part of this. Uh, Uh, in a product. We put minus here uh, because uh, the time, time derivative part uh, should be on the left hand side. Okay. Here again, we use a similar uh, Calculation now we are here and you see this is oh. ah I'm sorry uh, this part should not be here. Okay, then Nabla u squared squared plus p of u Nabla u. And this term is a further written as follows. Okay, 
So we have uh, we have uh, uh, I uh, made a mistake. We need. Uh, DT with one half here. Then this part is the same, and we have one Nabra uh, to the modulus U squared, and here. And taking all the uh, time derivative on the uh, left hand side, uh, we have mm, okay. Uh, let me write the conclusion. Uh, now a plus u squared, and uh, here is one half of uh, Nabra uh, u squared and squared uh, plus uh, here yeah, one half Nabra u squared plus uh one third of u and six norm and the right hand side we are we have the nabra u squared u not plus u and this is a new identity And here we have, uh, we estimate the right hand side of this identity like this, uh, u infinity, uh, now write u, the phonon squared, and Laplace u. And here we use uh, another uh, Gariot Nirenberg type inequality uh, to have u squared uh, uh, u two. And this is bounded by the energy. Uh, so we uh, left with infinity and u h to the square. And this is bounded by variant uh, medium bound of inequality. With uh, square root. So then, uh, solving integral uh, equation, we had the constant and another use of Gaia Nierenbau type inequality. This is power of t squared. So uh, uh, we uh, made an improvement on the estimates of 
um, a two null. Okay, so uh, let me compare. Uh, the original argument and uh, new argument. The original argument is it's too long. It's bounded uh, by a constant. Uh, uh, of of. Uh, bad term and a uh, good term. And and that term uh, uh, is infinity squared in Laplace U and good term is Now, are you uh, four null? And uh, the original Galway argument of uh, Grace and Galway uh, should control this bad term. Uh, on the contrary, our method. Uh, we call the left hand side is modified energy. This batch has been absorbed uh, in this uh, time uh, modified energy. And we are left with good term on the right hand side. And uh, this uh, bad term has been absorbed uh, on the basis of uh, transposed lightning tool and making a uh, divergence term or exact term. Okay. Uh, uh, we have uh, just uh, called this is uh, modified energy. And uh, uh, we are going to uh, explain applications. Uh, in the method, by, by the method we I introduced. Applications in uh, a So our argument uh, uh, admits um, much more general uh, nonlinearity, uh, and uh, uh, our argument is applicable to cardiac, not cubic, nonlinearity on half of equations as well as nonlinear shooting equation. Uh, global existence in two space dimensions and over extinction so extinction. 
program for nonlinear Schrodinger equations with friction. In two space dimensions. We see the joint work with Remy color. And uh, uh, Zakharov. Right. Uh, system. This is recent joint work with my student, uh, Tom Yoka. This is dimension uh, two and uh, two, and also dimension two. And uh, our method is applicable to Klein Gordon Schrodinger. Equations with dimensions two, three, four uh, in general domain. And uh, uh, in uh, the ap ap application of, of uh, modified energy, uh, we use the TU instead of uh, uh, rather technical uh, calculations. Uh, why? Uh, this uh, means that uh, DTU squared is uh, plus U minus U, uh, U squared, and this is equal to uh, plus U squared minus two real part uh, plus U uh, U squared U plus U six six. And uh, uh, this right hand side is uh, very uh, similar to the original one. Uh, Laplace here is the same. And uh, uh, the coefficient one of us. So one third is different, but here uh, I should uh, re uh, emphasize that uh, uh, the notion of modified energy is not unique. And uh, again, this second and third term is the same. Uh, as this time, uh, we uh, we write this uh, middle term uh, into the uh, two positive definite terms, and uh, here the notion. Uh, this is a linear part. H2 part. This is a potential part uh, coming from the self introduction of potential uh, nonlinear term. And this term is uh, interaction term between linear term and 
नहीं आता तो दैट्स व्हाई वे कुड रिमूव सम ऑफ द बट बट इफेक्ट फ्रॉम द नॉन लिनियर सम थ्रू दिस इंटरेक्शन uh okay so uh i will stop uh, my talk and thank you for your attention thank you professor osawa very interesting talk and now if anybody has a question for professor osawa can raise his hand in the not literally with the with the zoom tool or write down in the chat uh, uh let me uh, i i forgot to that last uh 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 explanation and here we and uh, modified energy this is not conserved quantity so uh we replace uh uh associate quantity from uh, uh no, including a nonlinear effect and this the delta t u uh, is can will be coming from uh time translation on uh time derivative so uh this is uh second time derivative and uh, from the variational point of view this is the first variation and this may be regarded as a second variation okay okay professor does anybody have a question for professor osawa I have a question, if I may, uh, Professor Osawa. Uh, do this uh, method of unified energy also applies for, um, let's say, uh, nonlinearities of higher order? Uh, pardon. Do this. Okay. Uh, sorry. Do this method of uh, unified energy applies also for? Um, Nonlinear terms, nonlinear powers of of figure order, nonlinear nonlinearities of figure order. Let's say, if a state of a absolute value of u square, one consider absolute value of u with one power p. Let's say. Uh, this uh, uh, the, the uh, as regards the problem of power. Uh, Gariato, I don't know. Uh, uh, Bridges Garvey, uh, logarithmic uh, inequality is essential. As for the uh, nonlinear shooting equation, uh, the power, uh, this power is critical. And the uh, uh the method of 
modified energy is uh, composed of uh, integration by parts. So, uh, so uh, very simple. So uh, I hope uh, the this method is applicable for a wide range of equations. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, if not, um, thank you, Professor Osawa. Thank you. Have a good day. Next talk will be in charge of Professor Carlos Kenick. And it will start soon. Professor Kenick, como estado? Bien, bien, que tal? Permítame presentarle a mis compañeros, Karina González de Colombia, Brian Grajales, Jessica González. Mucho gusto. Hola, profesor, mucho gusto, ¿qué tal? Muy bien, gracias. Profesor, entonces, eh, pues deseamos leer algunas palabras en español y en inglés en lo que sigue para presentarle y después procedemos con, si le parece bien. Muy bien, eh... Yo hago el share de, de la... De la pantalla. De la pantalla. ¿Le parece bien ahora? Sí, señor. Bueno. Ok, muy bien. Bueno, eh, ¿le parece, profesor, si esperamos un par de minutos? Sí, pero primero quiero eh, poner reformato, eh, poner en otro formato, ¿no? Que quiero. Ok. Full screen mode o algo así. Sí, sí. Ahí. Aquí está. ¿Lo ven? Sí, profesor. Vemos la presentación que dice Soliton Resolution and Channels of Energy. Sí, perfecto. Muy bien. Muy bien. ¿Y quieres probar si pasan? Ok, sí. perfecto. Excelente. Muy bien. Excelente. Solo quizá un minuto más. Sí, como no, como, como les venga mejor. <ríe> ¿Qué tal está el clima? En está bastante Chicago? bien. Por suerte, sí. está bastante bien todavía. Sí, hoy tenemos un, un día muy lindo de otoño. Muy lindo de otoño, muy bien. Bueno, listo, creo que podemos iniciar. Uh, buen día para todos. Mil gracias por conectarse. Es mi motivo de alegría introducir a uno de los analistas latinoamericanos más influyentes de nuestro tiempo. De la tierra de la milonga y del tango, la tierra de Cortázar, de Borges, de Gardel, de Mercedes Sosa, señores, señoras de Cerati, del Che, y por supuesto de Alberto Calderón y de Cora Sadowski. Hoy nos acompaña el profesor Carlos Koenig. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation. It's my great pleasure to present one of the most influential Latin American analysts of our time. Argentina is the country of Milonga, of the tango, the country of Cortázar, of the great Borges, of Mercedes Sosa, of Cerati. Argentina is the country of Alberto Calderon and Cora Sadowski, and then of one of our plenaries today, Professor Carlos Koenig. Professor Koenig is an Argentine-American mathematician and professor in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Chicago. He is known for his work in harmonic analysis and partial differential equations. He is the current president of the International Mathematical Union. Professor Kenny obtained his PhD at the University of Chicago in 1978 under the supervision of Alberto Calderon. Since then, he has held positions at Princeton University and the University of Minnesota before returning to the University of Chicago in 1985. He has done extensive work in elliptic and dispersive partial differential equations. 
He is a member of the National Academy of Science since 2014. His students include Sean Wei Chen, Ming, King Ming, Hu, Gigliola Stafilani, and Paniagota Daskalopoulos. Between his collaborators, one can mention Elias Stein, Christopher Sock, Luis Vega, Gustavo Ponce, Gunter Ullmann, Johannes S. Jostran, Cora Sadowski, David Jerison, Michael Christ, Antonio Carberi, and many, many other mathematicians showing, showing your generosity when sharing math ideas. For his important contributions to harmonic analysis, partial differential equations, and in particular to nonlinear dispersive partial differential equations, Professor Kenny has been awarded with the Salem Prize in 1984. He was invited speaker in 1986 and the International Congress of Mathematicians. And in 2002, he was elected fellow of the American Academy of Art and Science in 2002. In 2008, he received the Buckner Memorial Prize. And he was a speaker in 2010 at the International Congress of Mathematicians. In 2014, he was elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. So, Professor Koenig, it's our great pleasure to have you in virtual form in Colombia today. So, thank you very much, and please uh, start. Bueno, eh, primero quería agradecerles mucho por esta invitación. Es un placer estar aquí con todos ustedes. Eh, Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with all of you. Uh, so uh, today I will be talking about uh, soliton resolution and channels of energy, which is a, a topic I've been uh, thinking and working on for the last 15 years or so. Since the 1970s, there has been a, a widely held belief in the math physics community that coherent structures and free radiation describe the long time asymptotic behavior of nonlinear waves. And this belief came to be known as the soliton resolution conjecture. Roughly speaking, this says that asymptotically for large time, solutions of nonlinear wave equations decouple as a sum of modulated traveling waves and a free radiation term, which typically solves an associated linear equation. I think this is a very remarkable and beautiful claim, which shows a simplification in the very complex asymptotics. The origin of this conjecture is a puzzling paradox in a numerical simulation that Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam conducted at Los Alamos uh, uh, after the end of World War II, and which was uh, really the birth of scientific computing. Fermi had decided that a great use for the maniac, which was the computer that they used for the calculations in the Manhattan Project, was to use it for a theoretical scientific purpose. This is how they discovered this paradox, something that Fermi called a minor discovery. He uh, died soon after that, and so he never saw the resolution of this uh, paradox. In the mid 1960s, uh, Martin Kruskal found an explanation for this paradox through the existence of solitons, traveling wave solutions for the correct De Vries equation, which is this tu plus d cubed xu plus u dxu equals zero, and uh, which models wave propagation in shallow channels. So solitons are traveling wave solutions, which are well localized and travel at constant speed, which could possibly be zero. The fact that KDV had solitons was first observed by an engineer, uh, Russell, in 1835, uh, while he was uh, riding on horseback in, in uh, Scotland, and he saw one of these traveling wave solutions, and he, he followed it for a very long time, and it remained the same. 
After Kraskal's discovery, he and Zabuski in 1965 conducted another very influential numerical simulation, which showed the emergence of solitons and multi-solitons, which are a superposition of uh, solitons which are well separated by modulation for the correct Debris equation. This simulation uh, has been extremely influential. It led uh, to the soliton resolution conjecture and to the theory of integrable nonlinear equations, which uh, was developed in order to explain the elastic collision of solitons that Kruskal and Zabuski observed. So by elastic collision of solitons, uh, what I mean is that there are two uh, traveling waves that travel at different speeds and eventually collide. And afterwards, after the collision, they re-emerge in the same shape as before and nothing else appears. And this is called the elastic collision of solitons. This would happen in a linear equation. And the remarkable thing is that it does happen in some nonlinear equations. Uh, and it has emerged that it's in the integrable equations that this kind of phenomenon can happen. So integrable nonlinear equations can be solved by a reduction to a collection of linear problems. <clears throat> it's a collection of uh, linear spectral, inverse spectral problems. It, it is an important class of equations because they model a, a lot of a very relevant physical phenomenon, phenomena, but it is a non-generic class of equations. If you perturb an integrable equation a tiny bit, it no longer remains uh, integrable. So, and uh, it has been observed that the, uh, they feature the, this elastic collision of solitons. Soliton resolution has been proved in a few integrable cases like the KDV equation. The proofs are still very challenging even in the integrable situation. And there are issues that are still not completely resolved even in the case of KDV. There have also been some results in non-integrable cases in perturbative regimes, new solitons, and in a parabolic settings where there's a preferred time direction and this leads leads to many monotonicity properties. This phenomenon of uh, soliton resolution seems to be universal. It has been observed numerically and experimentally in, for example, the dynamics of gas bubbles in a compressible fluid. And this, you can do lab experiments for this. And in the formation of black holes in gravitational collapse, which of course you, you see numerically. The mechanism that's observed for relaxation to a coherent structure, which is observed both numerically and experimentally, is the radiation of excess energy to spatial infinity. Of course, energy is preserved, but what seems to happen is that the energy is displaced in space, and each time it's moved very far away, a new soliton emerges in the decomposition. Proving this in non-integrable settings is one of the major goals in nonlinear equations of wave propagation. So let me now turn to the progress in this direction obtained in the last uh, 15 years for a particular class of uh, equations of wave propagations, the energy critical nonlinear wave equations. And uh, here is the formulas uh, the D'Alembertian of U, the squared TU minus Laplacian of U equals the nonlinearity U to the four over absolute value of U to the four over N minus two times U. And it's an initial value problem. So we assign the initial value U naught in the energy space H1 of functions with a gradient in L2. And uh, the, it's a time derivative at time zero which is a, a supposed to be square integral. And this uh, Hilbert space we will call H, the script H. Um, 
and there are two initial conditions because there's a second derivative in time. So the, uh, these equ equations are called critical for the energy because there's a scaling uh, for the equation. If u is a solution, u sub lambda, which is one over lambda to the n minus two over two times u of x over lambda t over lambda, this is also a solution. And uh, the feature that this uh, scaling has is that it leaves invariant the h norm of the initial data. Okay, so it's the same for all lambda. And since this is the energy norm, we call this equation critical for the energy. Okay, the H norm is what we call the energy norm. So the first results in the direction of soliton resolution for this uh, equations were uh, proven what we call below the ground state which are uh, results with optimal size constraints. And this was part of the co concentration compactness rigidity theorem method that uh, I developed with Merrill in the period 2005-2008. We understood then that rigidity theorems uh, of the type of the Newville uh, theorem that we all seen in complex analysis uh, bounded uh, analytic functions need to be constant, classifying uh, uh, certain nonlinear objects, which we call non-radiative solutions, are crucial to understand the asymptotic dynamics. In this work with Merle, uh, it, it was understood that even if a nonlinear wave equation is not an integrable equation, one can take advantage of some decoupling which is related to the finite speed of propagation that wave equations have. And we can use this uh, advantageously to study this uh, problem of solid resolution. So typically what one would like to show in this uh, Newville type results, this classification results, is that all nonlinear objects or all non-radiative solutions are solitons or traveling wave solutions. So the first thing we need to do here is to identify what are the solitons, the traveling wave solutions. It turns out that of course, if you delete the, uh, the time term and you consider solutions that are independent of, of time, this leads you to solutions of the very well-known uh, nonlinear elliptic equation, Laplacian of Q, plus q to the four over n minus two in absolute value times q equal to zero, where we assume that q has a gradient in L2 and is not identically zero. Uh, this equation is very well known in uh, geometry because it arises in the solution of the Yamabe problem in differential geometry. And it, it turns out that the only traveling wave solutions for the nonlinear wave equation are either the solutions to the nonlinear elliptic equations or their transforms by the action of the Lorentz group. So you act on space time by the Lorentz group and you compose the action with a, a static solution and you get the traveling wave solution. And this is the collection of all traveling wave solutions. And this uh, we proved with Ducaire and Merrill uh, in 2014. If you are in the radial case, uh, Lorentz transformations destroy radiality. So we only have a static solutions. And as part of the work on the Yamabe problem, it emerged that this specific function, W of X, one plus X squared over N over N minus two to the power minus N over two over two, and it's dilates, uh, and uh, rescalings performing the, the transformation that I showed earlier and plus or minus are the only static solutions. This uh, eventually is a theorem of uh, Gida's knee theorem. Uh, this W plus minus lambdas are called the ground state because they have among the traveling wave solutions, the least energy. If you compute their energy, this gives you the, the minimum. And there's a gap between them 
and the next solutions. So in this study, a uh, first notion of non-dispersive solution or non-linear non object was the solutions with the compactness properties in time. That is to say, solutions whose trajectory is pre-compact up to the in the energy space up to the invariances of the equation. Now this is a nonlinear object because for the linear solution the only such objects are, uh, is the the only such object is the zero solution. So the concept of solutions with the compactness property in time was introduced for the cor correct risk equation around 2000 by Martel and Merrill, by myself and Merrill for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation and also for the nonlinear wave equation. Uh, early results were on the classification of uh, solutions with the compactness property. The first ones were under energy constraints, uh, provided the energy is below the energy of the ground states, uh, of the ground state. And this is uh, due to myself and Merrill from the uh, year 2008. In the radial 3D case, without any size constraint, for, for, by, by Dukair, myself, and Merle in 2011. And then in, finally, the non-radial case with no energy constraints, by Dukair, myself, and Merle in 2016. Now, it turns out, however, that if we are interested in soliton resolution, we have to consider multi-solitons. And uh, this notion is, is not sufficient to cover the case of multi-solitons. So this notion turns out to be insufficient for the case of uh, soliton resolution. So the first results towards the resolution uh, above the level of the ground state were results near the ground state. And they were obtained by Dukair and myself and Merle in 2011 and in 2012. Now, uh, there was the realization that to, one could try to prove this, the composition into solitons, not for all times, but just for well-chosen sequences of times. Uh, this is analogous to, to do a, a, a calculus analogy to replacing a convergence of a series to convergence of the Cesaro means of the series. And uh, so it is, of course, easier. So for solutions bounded in the energy norm, we a collection of results for soliton resolution along well-chosen sequence of times uh, were made. But then finally, the first result without this uh, restriction for solutions bounded in the energy norm, which is a necessary condition because if the soliton resolution holds, you will have a bounded in the energy norm solution. And this is something we will assume from now on. Uh, the first results were, uh, were obtained in 2013, as I will mention before, but for well-chosen sequences of time uh, with Dukair and Merrill, we did this in the radial case for n equals to three. My former student uh, Rodriguez did this in 2016 for all odd n dimensions again in the radial case uh, with a uh, Cot, Laurie, and Schlag. We did this in the four-dimensional case, and uh, with uh, Howard Gia who was my postdoc at the time, we did this in the six dimensional case. And finally, also with Gia, Duikair, and Merle in 2017, we proved the soliton decomposition for, us, for sequences of times, even in the non-radial case here, in dimensions three, four, and five. But to understand the full problem, which is a real uh, aim, that is to say, to prove the decomposition for all times, we realized at this point that what one needed to do is understand collision of solitons in analogy to what uh, Kruskal and Zabuski did numerically in their experiments on uh, KDV. 
So what one needs to prove is that in these non-integrable cases, all collisions, instead of being elastic, are inelastic. So this is a stark contrast to the integrable case. And they produce radiation. So each time two solitons collide, they re-emerge, but something extra emerges, which is radiation. And if you take account of this and uh, you see that this cannot happen infinitely many times because it would contradict the boundedness in the energy norm that we're assuming. And the fact that this collisions then can only happen a finite uh, number of times means that eventually they stop happening. And this is what is used to prove that the solid resolution holds for all times. Okay, but one thing is to believe this, another the thing is to prove this, of course. The approach was introduced uh, with Ducaire and Merle in 2013, where we proved the full soliton resolution in the radial 3D case. And this was the first proof of soliton resolution in a non-integrable Hamiltonian PD. We fully developed this method uh, through the years in a series of papers in 19, 20, and 21, where we managed to prove in all, all odd dimensions the, uh, in the radial case, the full solid resolution, and proved that uh, collisions of solitons are inelastic. And uh, precisely uh, what you can think of proving is that uh, an object called a pure multi soliton, which is a solution which is asymptotically a sum of decoupled solitons in both positive time and negative time as you go to infinity and with no radiation produced uh, is what we call a pure multi soliton and uh, it is expected that uh, this rules out pure multi-solitons, and we did in this, we did prove that for uh, the odd dimensions in the radial case. Uh, examples of this had previously been uh, observed in work of Martel Merrill for the generalized KDV and for the nonlinear wave equation in dimension five. So to deal with the issue of multi-solitons, we introduced this concept of non-radiative solutions. So these are solutions for the nonlinear wave equation, which are defined on the exterior region to a fattened cone, light cone. Uh, in this model, the, the speed of light is one. Okay, so that's why we talk about this light cone. And uh, the property that the solutions have to have to co be called non-radiative -ra is that the outer part of the energy tends to zero as, tend to, as time goes to plus infinity and to minus infinity. A reason for the usefulness of this uh, concept for the nonlinear wave equation is that if you use finite speed of propagation and you're only going to study the, uh, first the exterior of a fattened cone, you can choose the R very large so that the initial norm in the energy space in the energy space in that region is small. And if you're dealing with small solutions, then they are, can be well approximated by linear solutions. And this is uh, how we use this decoupling idea. Now, uh, the concept is also connected to uh, certain lower bounds for solutions of the energy critical wave equation. And this is what I will uh, uh, display here as dagger. What a dagger says is that if you take the limit for a solution of the linear wave equation uh, in these outside regions, they're bounded from below by the outside energy of the initial time, if you sum them. Now, dagger is 
only true for r equal to zero. So this validity of dagger, which is the inequality for linear equations that you would like to have, uh, depends strongly on dimension. So uh, please try to retain dagger because it will be crucial for the rest of this story. Uh, for odd dimensions, when r equals zero, dagger holds for all uh, linear solutions with data in the energy space. And uh, we proved that with Ducar and Merle in 2012. In the case when r is positive and n equals uh, 3 in the radial case, uh, this uh, was uh, first proved around 2009 with uh, Ducar and Merle. But it doesn't hold for all solutions. There's an exception. The exception is the one whose data is the Newtonian potential, 1 over r0. For this solution, if you solve the linear wave equation and you look at it outside these cones, uh, the limit on the left is 0, but on the right it's not. OK. So what we do is uh, to deal with exceptional uh, direction, uh, direction that we have to take out from the uh, inequality dagger is note that the asymptotics of the ground state in n equals to 3 are the same as the asymptotics uh, of the Newtonian potential. And so somehow the, this uh, ground state, if you uh, properly uh, modulated by scaling, uh, can be used to eliminate in the linear theory the bad uh, example. And this leads to the following very strong rigidity theorem. For uh, dimension three, for any positive r, the solitons are the only non-zero, non-radiative solutions of the nonlinear wave equation. So for many years, we believed that this was true in all dimensions. Uh, Remarkably, this is false for all n bigger than or equal to 5. And this uh, we just proved in a recent work uh, with uh, Colo, uh, Duikair, and Merle. Uh, th this work is uh, uh, being uh, finalized as we speak. So once we had this strong rigidity, we could prove the full soliton resolution in three dimensions. So for the odd case, odd dimensional case, radial in dimensions five and, and higher, this inequality sharp that I mentioned early fails for a much bigger but finite dimensional subspace. So it's an n minus one over two uh, co-dimensional sub subspace for which it holds. So now we have many more enemies to kill from the linear inequality. But, but we, uh, oh, and, and this was the result that I proved with uh, uh, Laurie Liu and Schlag in 2015. But so now we have many more enemies to kill, but we have only scaling at our disposal. So this didn't allow us to prove the strong rigidity uh, using the scaling as we did in 3D. So we had to devise a much more involved proof, which goes by first uh, using asymptotic estimates for non-radiative solutions of the nonlinear wave equation, which you can still derive from this inequality sharp. Then from that, you derive related estimates for the linearized operator around the, the ground state. And then you have to do a very careful study of the modulation equations in the scalings of the soliton of the ground states and solitons close to a multi-soliton for non-radiative solutions. 
And it's this uh, modulation parameters that give you the extra freedom to uh, kill the bad guys in the sharp equation, in the sharp inequality. So this gives you enough parameters to deal with, with this large dimensional exceptional subspace. And we were able to prove the full soliton resolution in this case. And uh, this is when the pandemic came. And uh, so let me go now to even solutions. For even solutions, this estimate sharp, which was valid for all odd dimensions, when the R was zero, fails for all even dimensions, even in the radial case. And this was a, a collection of examples that uh, I found with uh, Cott and Schlag in 2014. Nevertheless, there was some redemption here. This inequality holds in the radial case when r equals zero for, uh, and for r bigger than zero for n congruent to for a finite co-dimensional space for two cases. When n is congruent to zero mod four, the data has to be u zero zero. And when n is congruent to two mod four, the data is zero u. So it flips as the dimension grows in fourths for which half of the data you have those inequalities. And uh, this uh, proof of this positive results for r equals zero was already in this paper with Cott and Schlag in 2014. For r positive, it's in work uh, during the pandemic with uh, Dukair, Martel, and Merle in 2021, and uh, simultaneously worked by Li Shen and Wei in 2021. So one can see in each even dimension that in the cases that this fails, it can be seen to be a consequence of an explicit sing singular solution, a singular resonant solution for the non-radiative solution for the linear wave equation that fails logarithmically to be in the energy space. So the, the uh, nonlinear wave equation in the four dimensional case, radial, was first treated fully given the full solid resolution with uh, Ducair, Martel, and Merle in 2021. And it turns out that this case is critical for the strong rigidity theorem mentioned earlier for the three dimensional case. For any R positive in the radial case, uh, uh, Ground state solitons are the only non radiative solutions, still uh, for n equals to four. And we proved this in the four dimensional case by a, an analysis based on separating the even and the odd parts of the solution. Because it's only for one of them that you have this favorable linear estimate. And uh, if you you do that, you notice that the nonlinear equations that they satisfy, uh, the nonlinearity is now cubic, and they are decoupled at the first order. So this uh, finished the 4D case, but there were difficulties in going to higher uh, even dimensions. So I'll now turn to the uh, to three papers in uh, 2022. Uh, there's a, a preprint on archive for all of them, which still misses uh, the classification results, which we're now concluding. And uh, eventually this will appear as three papers. And uh, we first proved the solid and resolution when n equals six by introducing replacements to the uh, false estimate for the data that give you the falsehood in dimension six. Six is congruent to two mod four. And so these are uh, the data for which there's counterexamples even for r equal to zero. 
but we found replacements for this estimate. So, but to do the decomposition, we needed to combine the results in n equals to four, which somehow uh, separate the even and odd parts of the solution, and the analysis for n odd bigger than or equal to five, which uses the modulation equations. And uh, this uh, two ways of thinking are very different. So some of the difficulties are that when n is bigger than four, we have a large dimension of the set of non-radiative linear solutions, uh, even uh, in the allowed uh, cases for the equation, where we have uh, this n minus one over two dimensional set of counterexamples. And it turns out now, we now realize that each one of these uh, anomalies in the linear case can be seen to lead to a non-trivial, non-radiative radial solution, also at the non-linear level. And it's different from the solid. And this is the, what constitutes the failure of strong rigidity. So to rule out the possibility of these counterexamples ruining the solid tone resolution, we have a reconnection problem. You, you can uh, produce these guys for very large R, and then extend them up to r equal to uh, a final r, the r star. And if this r star is positive, then it, it doesn't harm you in the uh, solid and resolution. But uh, if the r gets to be positive, it actually yields a counterexample to the full solid and resolution. Now, to, to, to solve this uh, reconnection problem, you know, these are notoriously difficult problems in nonlinear analysis. Uh, we argued by a contradiction, and uh, for the half data for which we should have the, this linear estimate sharp, we don't have it because there's this resonant linear solution, which you can see fails to be logarithmic, fa fails logarithmically to be in the energy space. And the existence of this solution blocked the use of the techniques of n bigger than or equal to five, even for the odd part of the solution and the corresponding modulation analysis. But we, we managed to find a way out by finding a different channel of energy estimate, which is now holding for solutions in the linearized equation around the ground state. So this is the linearized equation around the ground state. It's, it's a linear equation with a potential, which is explicit in terms of the ground state. Now we define uh, well, uh, the exterior energy to be the limit as t goes to plus and minus infinity of the outer energies, and we sum the two limits. This inequality sharp says that if UL solves the free linear wave equation, then the square root of E out is bounded from below by the energy norm. This holds for the odd dimensions, and the even dimensions, let's say for n equals to 6, we can bound just this part from below, use this bound from below. And in the, that's in the four dimensional case, I'm sorry. And in the six dimensional case, we only have this. And the full estimates fail because of these resonant counterexamples. Now for the uh, linearized wave equation, which I recall, let's see if we can do it, is this equation now. Uh, it's e easy to see that this is, that there's two explicit counterexamples which are in the kernel of the linearized e equation, in the null space of the linearized equation. And these are well-known objects that are generated by the infinitesimal generator of dilations. And 
this is lambda w, which is given by this formula, and t lambda w. And for uh, n bigger than or equal to 5, these are in L2, and they are then uh, uh, acceptable here, and they are in the kernel of the uh, linearized operator, and so the linearized operator cannot have a, a, a lower bound for these guys. So uh, in the odd dimensional case, <clears throat> we showed that if we projected away in the odd dimensional cases of this finite co-dimension spaces, and then for the linearized equation away from the uh, span of this one dimensional solutions, then we do have the lower bound for the outer energy. Now, this fails for all n even. And uh, for uh, dimension six for data of this kind, of this kind but we devised a, a procedure to, uh, <coughs> with a, a sharp color <coughs> to uh, remedy this situation. So we now introduce a new uh, norm, which is a, a localized L2 norm but which is uh, modified by a logarithmic weight because the logarithms that arise in these resonances are what kill us in the previous inequality. And then what we proved is that for all solutions of the linearized equation for a, a n equals to six, this outer energy is bounded from below by the L2 norm projected away from uh, T, uh, from lambda W, and in the H1, uh, in the U0 direction, uh, when you project away from lambda W by the Z norm. And once we had this estimate, uh, we could go back uh, and prove the uh, solid and resolution conjecture. The last ingredient was to prove a weakened uh, rigidity theorem, not a strong rigidity theorem, but the theorem that says that if U is not a soliton, you have this lower energy bounds, but not for all R0, but for well chosen R0. So for any solution which is not a soliton, there's a lower bound of the exterior energy, but only for well-chosen R0. So this is a very important ingredient. It holds for uh, n equals five, uh, uh, even also. And uh, now let me uh, remark that a few months after the results that I mentioned earlier on the solitary resolution were posted, uh, Gendridge and Laurie in 2022 posted a different proof uh, of the solitary resolution for radial NLW for all n bigger than or equal to four. And they did this also by showing an elastic collision of solitons but not through rigidity theorems like we're doing, but by a no return analysis in following ideas in dynamical systems, as in earlier work they did for equivariant wave maps. And this no return analysis in wave settings started out with work by Ducaire and Merle in 2008, Nakanishi Schlag in 2011 and Krieger Nakanishi Schlag in 2013. And uh, these ideas were then taken up by uh, Gender and Laurie to give an alternate approach to these problems. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kenny, for this very interesting talk. So uh, we are open for questions. Remember that you can make your question raising your hand, and then we will uh, give you the permissions to ask your question. 
Okay, maybe Daniel Campos. Okay, Daniel. Hola, Daniel. Eh, buenos días. Vamos a... Un buen encuentro. ¿Se escucha bien, sí? Sí, sí, se escucha. Ah, ok, perfecto. Eh, voy a hacer la pregunta en español porque hace tiempo que no hablo en inglés y se me olvidó un poco, ¿verdad? ¿Cómo no? Bueno, eh, yo, yo la traduzco, Daniel. Ok, muchas gracias. Que, eh, digamos, esa, esa diferencia tan extraña que hay entre pares e impares eh, viene de algo más profundo que la diferencia entre pares e impares, digamos, de la ecuación de onda eh, regular, por ejemplo, ¿verdad? Eh, sí, sí, sí. Oh. Eh, ok, so the, the question was, is this a strange difference between even and odd dimensions for the linear wave equation? Uh, does it have a justification that's uh, just the fact that we can uh, that we can produce counterexamples or not? Uh, the answer is yes, but you cannot see this directly. Uh, the the difference between the two is in the uh, strong Huygens uh, principle that holds for three D, which means that the propagation uh, of sound is a uh, through much smaller regions in uh, odd dimensions than in even dimensions. As for instance, for example, if you're standing and a, a supersonic plane above you goes by, you only hear it for one instant. And then the boom disappears because you're in 3D. But if you see the little waves on a pond when you put, when you throw a stone, you see that they the remnants of the of these uh, waves keep appearing forever even though they become very very little and this is the the reason for this i see i uh, thank you uh, 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 for the talk and it was nice to see all these new all these new uh, uh, results from 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 very from very recent years yeah yeah So uh, Daniel was my student, so it's uh, always a pleasure to see him. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Very nice space than this um, conference. So other question here we have Tania Berres. So Tania, you can in, in mute yourself. Good good morning. How are you doing? Um, I'm okay. I, I, I would like to. I I just I'm um, a mathematician who works for numerical methods for partial differential equations, yeah. and uh, I like uh, I like the interpretation of them um, as a projection method, both finite volume and finite element methods, okay. and uh, that's why um uh, this that's not my area of research, but I would like to ask you. Uh, what is uh, in in one of your estimates? That is a wonderful talk, and thank you very much for it. In one of your estimates, you project the functions u zero and u one uh, one uh, to a to a certain space. It says in just one of your estimates, and yeah. I would like to ask you to which space you project the these functions. Yeah. And so, what is the idea behind that? This is a nice idea. I like yeah. to my yeah. yes, I, yes, I, I can answer that. I mean, I think the easiest one is for the <clears throat> to explain is the one on the linearized operator uh, around W, where we project in the direction orthogonal to the solution uh, to the span of the solution lambda W. So what we're doing by doing that is eliminating the direction that, uh, in uh, in the energy space that gives rise to a counterexample to what we're trying to prove. So for all solutions that are perpendicular to this, there is a lower bound, but if they are in the direction of this, they're not. And this is a, an explicit uh, solution that's identified. Uh, what, what, would, what would be the direct sum behind that? Would you repeat me that? I don't... Yeah. 
what, what is the direct sum, sum behind the, 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 this projection? What is the sum of the, if, yeah, the, if it, the, the direct the, sum of, of two spaces? One, 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 one sum is a one dimensional space. Yes, the, yes. Mul the multiples of this function that I called uh, lambda w. Let me see if I can go back. Yes, yes, I see. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Yes, I, I would. I should think about your answer because it's not my area. The court of the yeah, freeze. So, so, so it's the orthogonal complement of this lambda w. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, okay. I, I, I will. I will study your work and then I perhaps I, I can I can understand more. Thank you so much. It's a very nice idea. I like it. it this projection very much. That's a, a strong, a strong, a strong feature. I, I bet. Thanks. Oh. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tanya, for your question. Yes, yes. So, thank the professor for this talk. Okay. Someone has more questions uh, for Professor Koenig? I just am, uh, I, I am wondering with, uh, when you mentioned the term, um, the coupling, the coupling, basically in this. Um, yes. This term decoupling, this this uh, is same uh, is the same decoupling like uh, in the words of Bourguin and Dimeter is similar to that or is completely different? It's a completely different decoupling. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, yeah. No, this, I, is I just... a, this is a decoupling in physical space, not a decoupling oh. in a, in frequency space. Okay, <laughs> Professor Ken, thank you very much. So, uh, any other question? So, if no more questions, so let's say thanks to Professor Carlos Kenick. Muchas gracias, Professor Carlos Kenick, eh, por esta charla. Con placer. Y le agradecemos mucho. Thank you very much. Con placer. Hasta la próxima. Hasta la próxima, profesor. Muy bien. So, So our next speaker is Professor Paula Cerejeiras from Portugal. Maybe, let's see if Professor Cerejeiras is. Yes, I am, it's just a matter of connecting my sound, sorry. Thank you. And my Thank video. You. We have enough time. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Okay. Let me also start. Can I start projecting slides? Yes, let me give you the permission. Uh, that should be perhaps better if you give permission to the iPad, Paula. Okay, yes. now your iPad has the permission. And let me, yes, that is a peer. And uh, you all can see the slides and everything is, I'm sorry, I have too many ecrans on my part. So it might be sounding like I'm looking to one side when I'm looking to the other. So, now it's up to you, Professor Duvan. Okay, so uh, the idea is that Cari Gonzalez and Jessica Gonzalez uh, will present you. Good uh, afternoon, Professor. They are, our, they are, are members you? of our organizing committee. So please, uh, Cari and Jessica, you can continue. Yes, um, we have prepared a short speech in Portuguese. And oh. in English to introduce you, okay? <laughs> Thank you, but okay. you can do it in Spanish. The persons who tell you that Portuguese don't understand Spanish are actually lying, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, come on. Bom dia a todos e a todas. É, é para mim muito prazeroso apresentar a nossa seguinte palestrante. Ela é a doutora Paula Cerejeiras. 
Paula, é professora associada do Departamento de Matemática da Universidade de Aveiro e membro do CISMAN, Centro de Investigação e Desenvolvimento em Matemática e Aplicações. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to introduce you our next speaker. She is uh, Dr. Uh, Paula Cerejeras. Paula Cerejeras is associated professor at the Mathematical Department of the University of Aveiro and member of CIDMA Center for Research and Development in Mathematics and Applications. Uh, seus interesses de pesquisa são análise de Clifford, transformar de, ra de Radon, geometria integral, análise harmônica e problemas inversos. Seus interesses atuais incluem teoria de representação de grupos e suas conexões com wavelets, desenvolvimento de teoria de funções discretas em relação à base de Witt e operadores parabólicos de Dirac, bem como os problemas inversos associados. Her research interests are in Clifford analysis, random transforms, integral geometry, harmonic analysis, and inverse problems. Her current interests include group representation theories and its connections with wavelets. The uh, development of the discrete function theories in relation to uh, with basis and parabolic Dirac operations operators, as well as the associated inverse problems. Ela tem diversas publicações, entre elas, artigos em revistas como Applied in, Computa in Computa Computational Harmonic Analysis and Communications in Pure in Applied Analysis. Tem coordenado e participado em vários projetos internacionais. Ela tem colaborações com diferentes cientistas na Alemanha, China, Itália, Estados Unidos, Hungria, Reino Unido e Bélgica. Foi membro editorial de Advanced in Applied Clifford Algebras, Birkhauser, entre outros, e editora associada em International Journal of Wavelets, Multi-Resolution and Information Processing. She has several publications, including articles in journals such as Applied and Computational Harmonic Analysis and Communications in Pure and Applied Analysis. She has coordinated and participated in several international projects. She has collaborations with different scientists in Germany, China, Italy, USA, Hungary, UK, and Belgium. She has been an editorial member of Advanced and Applied Clifford Algebras, among others, and is an associated editor of the International Journal of Wavelets, Multi-Resolution and Information Processing World Scientific. Hoje, ela nos ensinará um pouco sobre a fórmula de Grotendig-Linsky para operadores quaternionicos. Muito obrigada por ter aceito o nosso convite. Uh, pode começar. Today, she will teach us a little on Grotendig-Linsky formula for quaternionic operators. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. You can start now. Thank you very much for your kind presentation. Actually, I have to say, I have to apologize that I would very much have attend much more of these talks, but unfortunately, I have a very bad semester full of classes and is really, really running from one place to the other. Anyway, Thank you very much. As far as I understand, you are having wonderful uh, talks there and showing very, well, intensive activity of the mathematicians in South America. So let me start with a topic which is a little bit out of the, let's just say, out of the part in the fact that I'm talking of quaternionic operators, so operators in dimensions higher than two. Anyway, the problem is that I'm going to speak on the Grotendieck-Litsky formula, which is a fancy way of describing or classifying when an operator, well, when you can invert an operator calculating 
the span of the solutions of, of operators, if the operator is compact, if not, and above all, it gives how to express the solutions of said operator in terms of the eigenvalues. Now, this is a very heavy talk topic already in real and complex case, and it has been recently generated to, uh, generalized to other settings. But the problem is, uh, yes, sorry. The problem is that um, quaternionic is, let's put it this way, a case of R4, which has several applications, for instance, in quantum mechanics, space time, the space Minsk Minkowski space, and so on. But unfortunately, if it is very nice in terms of the dimensions, it's very untraitable in terms of the commutativity because, uh, well, that's the, more or less the problem. When you go higher in the dimensions, you start losing. In order to maintain the structure of our algebra, you're going steadily losing properties. And the first property you lose when you pass from complexes to quaternions is commutativity. But anyway, a little bit more ahead, Right now, this is a joint work with Fabrizio Colombo and Irene Sabadini from Politecnico de Milano and some two colleagues from Aveiro, Alberto de Bernardi and Uwe Kehler. So let me first make a recapitulation in terms of the classic complex Hilbert spaces, how you describe it for a separable complex Hilbert space. You pick an orthonormal base and simply you describe a compact self adjoint linear operators in terms of a sequence of real numbers, the eigenvalues, and you describe simply the action, the coefficients of the elements in the bases, multiply by the bases and use the span in your eigenspace that you are working. This allowed you to decompose the space in terms of the kernel, which is, in general, the part with everything goes fine, plus a span, a non-trivial span in terms of the eigenvalues. This is the case when you have a self-adjoint operator. When the operator is not self-adjoint, you need a little bit a bigger trick which is simply using polar decomposition. You multiply the operator with this adjoint, extract the square root, and you get ensure that your operator is positive, self-adjoint. And now the eigenvalues for this operator are all positives and having an accumulation point at zero. So, so far, everything goes fine for the module of. But of course, if you are having a modulus, you are also come a part which is more or less radial, which is in case, I call it V, it's a partial symmetry. And that partial symmetry, it's going to be defined by being zero in the kernel, this partial symmetry, it's going to be zero in the kernel of your operator. Uh, yes, kernel of a operator. And it's going to be such that it preserves the norm of the vector in the orthogonal. So it may, uh, well, it acts as a unitary operator outside the kernel. And if you do that, then now you construct a second base of well, basis is an euphemism, orthonormal set, and you describe now the operator that you have initially, you now describe it in terms of the coefficients on that new orthonormal set and in terms of the eigenvalues of the module of the operator. So these eigenvalues of the modulus are important and I call the singular values of the operator T. 
And this also implies that you can construct now, give a structure of a norm space for the different classes of operators classified in terms of the coefficients that you have in this coefficient singular or eigenvalues. In general, you prefer the singular values because they are easy to study. So you first start by defining a trace. And frankly, the part is you are quite used to traces in matrices, but trace is in fact a mapping that picks an operator and makes correspond a complex, sorry, a complex value, value. And that value is independent of the basis you use in your space. And that is in the important part. So you have your trace and you can now classify the operator in terms of the singular values being or not in the small LP space. So that's exactly more or less what this condition that this series is finite. Simply the sequence of singular values are in the small LP. In Hilbert case, the P equal to one correspond to trace class, one, two, three, trust trace class, and it corresponds to say that your opera operator is compact. But if you are in a Banach, then you start making a little bit of a different. You still have Schatten classes. You still have a norm for the space of operators, but that norm, which by the way, is for P larger or equal than one, allows you to create different norms. And the Hilbert-Schmidt norm corresponding to the singular values being in small L2 is estimated above by the norm in the trace class. If your operator is in trace class, you make sure that this norm is finite and you make sure that your operator has a finite Hilbert-Schmidt norm. Now, the grothendieck litsky formula, trace formula, is actually normally persons look only at describing the trace in terms of the eigenvalues, but that formula has actually two parts. The first formula tells me that the trace of the operator is given by the series of the eigenvalues of the operator. And there is a second part who classify me, classify the determinant of identity plus T in terms of a infinite product of one plus the eigenvalues. And this last one is in general necessary when you want to classify it in terms of the Fred Hall determinant. But the important part here is exactly what I'm not saying, but luckily I, I wrote it here not to forget, is that these definitions are independent of whatever basis you choose in your Hilbert space. Now, if you change for complex, the situation, complex panak, recall you only have norms. So the only thing you can work is in terms of a basis for your space, a basis for the panak, and then you catch as functionals for the dual space, and you construct a biorthogonal system such that the functional acting on the element of the space is the delta of Kronecker. If you do that, then you can write the operator in terms of the action of the elements of the base and the functional evaluated at the adjoint, the adjoint of the operator times the function, applied to the functional and evaluate this. And you have the possibility 
to pick any algebra, any finite rank operator. And here I have to say, finite rank is a fancy way of saying simply that your operator can be represented by a matrix, or you can think of it as a, a matrix and nothing else. You can pick a finite rank operator and decompose the Banach space in a orthogonal, in a direct sum of two, such that the image of the second by the operator doesn't leave the space, and the other, the image of the other part is in the kernel. Uh, it's zero, so that space is in the kernel. That's more or less what you need, but still you can get formulas for the operator, describing the operator in terms of the eigenvalues. And now I'm going to speak a little bit on the applications for this setting. There are several applications. One which is quite fashionable nowadays is actually coming from numerics you have a given operator, bounded linear operator in a Hilbert space, and you want to know what the range values this subset of the complex plane is going to have when you restrict yourself to the unit ball, to the well, unit, well, norm of x equal one. This allows you afterwards to make a proper location of the spectrum of your operator. Another application is for the wave trace formula applied to the invariant Laplacian, to the sub-Laplacian, to, uh, sub to the Laplacian, which is having a compact resolvent and a discrete spectrum then you can describe the ter trace in terms of a kind of group action. And that group action is given again by the characters, or let's put it exponential of it, square root of your eigenvalues. Another application, but that linked to scatter scattering theory, comes from uh, making shifts of the functions and using a relation between the analysis of these shifts and scattering theory. Now, I that one is the one I know the least, except that is quite applicable in quantum theory of crystals. So, nevertheless, these are the applications of the classic complex case. But there are even more applications. For instance, works on uh, Schatten classes for pseudo differential operators, operators which are only given by the symbol, and you classify the spaces according to the properties of the symbol. These, there are some initial papers of Toft, but several persons restart extending not only to specific symbols, but also for group theory applications on um, compact groups or nilpotent groups. For instance, Julio Delgado, which is one of the colleagues I knew from um, Imperial College London, is one of the persons who work in this area. So, now that I brag more or less the field, let me pass for what are quaternions and what are quaternions operator, why they are needed, and what are the problems that we are going to face. The problems, the reason why one looks at quaternionic linear operators is actually one nice paper of Birkhoff and Neumann which show that you can make interpretation of quantum mechanics in terms of matrices with quaternion entries. 
But the problems that you have is quaternions are non-commutative. The second is you don't think much about it, but determinant is defined by matrices of complex entries only. And worse than that, even when you have a determinant, the definition that you have of spectrum, spectrum works more or less like trying to invert the operator I minus T. And that in order to invert that operator, you need a, a kind of commutativity, which in quaternions, again, you don't have. So let me first give a little bit of what we need for quaternions. It's an extension of the complex numbers. So it can be viewed as putting the vectorial space of four dimensions. But now I'm going to consider a scalar part and a vectorial one. With these elements, these basis, vector bases, satisfying this strange correspondence. So the product of ij is anti commuting and gives again another vector, which makes life a little bit problematic. Still, you can do a lot with it because you can build a correspondent conjugation as in complex plane. You simply pick the scalar and invert the vectorial part, all fine. This also has the property that when you multiply these two elements, you get back the norm, the original norm in the vectorial space R4, and therefore every non-zero element is invertible. Now, up to here, this is nothing. The important is, and this was important in the 80s, where the programs, well, where the programmers had to accelerate some software, and they realized that to make rotations, using it only on terms of matrices was completely impossible. And the reason they suddenly could use quaternions and use, could use quaternions because the real part encodes the information of the angle of the rotation. Information on the rotation of the angle, actually half the angle, while the vectorial part encodes the information on the axis of rotation. And if you have an element which is in the unit sphere of R4, then you can induce a rotation in the vector space simply by multiplying by S minus one at left vector and S at right, and you have ensured that you have still a vector back. So, Still, the lack of commutativity creates problems because the first thing you have to think is this one. You have an operator and your operator is in general acting on the left. So if you have your operator acting on the left, then you can only put constants, scalars, quaternionic scalars on the right, which means that you are no longer have a space, but indeed a right linear module. That's the first point. The second comes with the eigenvalues. Now, if you don't have commutativity, you have two options. Either you put the eigenvalue at left or the eigenvalue at right. But since your idea is always decompose the solutions in terms of combinations of your linear space. Look what happened if you put 
uh, sorry, mistake. If you put your eigenvalue on the left, you have the eigenvalue associated, but now you have the constant on one side, the eigenvalue on the other, and the value in the middle. So that means that left eigenvalues are actually not the good tool to work. So we are going to concentrate only on the right eigenvalues, never the left ones. Even so, we have a problem because if this element, if lambda is an eigenvalue, I simply multiply by an S, an element in the unit sphere by the right. This goes, then S, S minus one is the identity. I change nothing, but now I have, this is nothing but a rotation. And I have now an eigenvector of the same problem. That means that I cannot really separate one single eigenvalue. What I have is an equivalence class determined in terms of the rotation that I implement in the element. And the problem that we have is not only that one, is that it also changed the eigenspace because if I have eigenvalues associated to lambda, then I have that the eigenvector associated to this appears now multiplied by S, meaning that the eigenspace is also changed when you rotate the eigenvalue, which is a strange notion. So this is the problems with the eigenvalues. Let's try the problems with the determinant. So, like I said, you don't have power series. So the classic determinant built by a characteristic polynomial of a certain matrix is not going to work that well. Now, luckily this problem has already attracted several attentions. There was the other name, more or less 1945, if I'm not mistaken, was already working on how to construct a determinant for this kind of algebras. But the most, the nicest one that we have is actually the approach from Gelfand. Well, let's put Gelfand Square, Retak, and Wilson, which is a nice paper the quasi-determinants of 2005. That idea is you need only an algebra with a unit, nothing else. The algebra can be commutative or not. And you look for a cyclic vector. What is a cyclic, cyclic vector? That means simply that you pick the vector. The vector is in a m-dimensional space. So now you're going to construct the operator apply to this, apply second time, et cetera, until you apply M minus one time. And this array of vectors should be a basis for your space VM, space you want to construct. Then your, you, you can construct a kind of characteristic polynomial, but that characteristic polynomial, which is nicely with coefficients, has a problem because these coefficients depend on your choice of the cyclic vector and of the operator that you have. So you don't have exactly independence of this characteristic polynomial and the vector that you choose. But nevertheless, they pay, play a role of a characteristic equation and you can define the determinant of the operator as the coefficient of the linear term. 
Of course, you need a priori knowledge of the eigenvalues, but that is something else. Now, I made here some more comments on the determinant. There are several. This is a problem who has attracted quite an attention. There is a is which is similar to the Diedonier determinant, but there is also an approach by Berezin and also by study who gave different approaches. And the approach of Berezin has the advantage that it works on Z2 grade algebras. Algebras when you can more or less say that you have an even, separating an even and odd part. That is more or less for the problems created by the lack of an appropriate determinant. Now you go for the appropriate definition of spectrum. The spectrum is simply the value in the classic case, the values of the um, scalars lambda for which this operator is not invertible. And that's normally what you use. But if you do remember, you don't have now exactly a eigenvalue, you have an equivalence class and the equivalence class has to be described by the invariant properties and the invariants are the scalar part of the element and the module of that. So you need two elements to describe, which seems to hint that the proper description for the spectrum is in fact in terms not of a first order equation, but of a second order one. And this was exactly the part where our colleagues in Milano help because there is now a concept of an S spectrum, which is simply coming from imposing that this equation, T squared plus two times the scalar part of the operator plus module of lambda is not invertible. This has four bases, a kind of um, an attempt of serious decomposition of this inversion operator, but still it has the properties that I want, a dependence of the scalar and of the module. So in the quaternionic case, this S spectrum coincides with the concept of right spectrum and the resolvent is now linked to a nice operator of sec inverse of an operator of second order, only that your resolvent is actually multiplying this by T minus lambda identity, and don't forget the minus, which recovers the inverse of a first order operator. In terms of the orders, everything seems to be beating correct. So now that we have more or less the tools uh, established, let's go for the definition of quaternionic vector space. First of all, if I want to have an inner product, be it in a Hilbert or defining or even for defining a functional, I need of a kind of a Hilbert, uh, a Siski linear form in this element, in this space. First of all, I define it as n apples and introduce a multiplication similar as in the case, traditional case of complex plane, but in such way that this is sesquilinear, so it comes out by the conjugate of, 
while is linear, right linear in the first variable. Now that property satisfies almost all properties of the inner product, almost, and also establish a norm on the part, only that it's necessary in order to build Clifford valued functionals. So now we pass, now that we more or less define what the matrices are going to be and how they are going to operate, we are going now to construct matrices and we are going to use the oldest trick in the world, which is describing the quaternion in terms of an appropriated sum of complex numbers, which is not 100% true. What I'm doing, let me see if I can enlarge a little bit. I have x plus y i, which I can identify with a complex number. Then I have a j, and if you do remember, I have b times k, but k is i j. So I can put a plus b j b i i and multiply by j. So I get here again an element of c i. So I can always get a quaternionic matrix in terms of the sum of two matrices with complex entries and multiply by i. But careful now with one thing. If I have this number in CI, multiply at left. When you jump, it jump over the scalar part, no problem but it gives symmetric part to the other. So I get to conjugate off. So it's a nice way of putting it, but still I have the non-commutativity affecting heavily here. Anyway, now that I have this matrix, I can use the usual description for complex numbers, which is nothing more than associated to this, a matrix of double size where it has A1, A2 as first row. And now this element conjugate and give minus sign, this element conjugate and stay. Is exactly how you do Z1 omega minus omega bar Z when you are in complex numbers, exactly the same trick, but now in matrices. This gives you what is called the companion matrix, which has the property of being now a matrix with complex entries of double size. There are several studies for this. The matrix is invertible if the determinant can be computed and is different from zero. The quaternionic eigenvalues of the original matrix Mn of H can now be obtained through the complex polynomial that we associate with the companion one, but with a problem. These are going to be, well, perhaps I should be reinforcing this, these are going to be complex numbers on ZI. But if you do remember the elements describe a class, an equivalence class, and that equivalence class, the rotation of these elements allow me to recover the remaining ones. And I still have to accelerate because I'm going a little bit slow. Okay. So, now that I have a matrix 
I'm going to study the case of the complex characteristic polynomial for the companion for a matrix with complex entries. I build the characteristic polynomials for which the determinant is well known and built. I have it. I have the, this is simply minus one trace of algebras of n minus k forms of over the matrix and so on. And you have the products well done. This formula is well known, no problem with that. What is now is, if you have a complex volume, you know that you will have the conjugate one. And the problem is, how do you recover this conjugate one? By the oldest trick, trick in the book, recalling that S bar, the conjugate, coincide with the inverse in the unit ball. So instead of picking now the characteristic polynomial, you are going to associate it, actually alternative no, associate, associate, an associate characteristic polynomial, which come by placing the Z multiplying here and making sure that this vanish in the inverse of the elements, which restricts to the uh, unit pole coincide exactly with the conjugate of. That means that you have now two polynomials to enter into account, this one and that one, and the different classes of eigenvalues for the original matrix has to be contained in the product of these two. So the product of one minus Z solution and one minus Z bar for associated to the second characteristic polynomial. And this gives you a nice formula for the characteristic polynomial of the companion matrix given by this expression, which depends on the scalar part and on the module of the element. So it contains all the information of the eigenvalues. So the safe part is that I'm going to have always two types of traces. Because if you look at the matrix, if you have the matrix A, you decompose in A1 plus A2 J. And now you have the companion matrix, which I recall is a complex entries with double size. A1, A1 bar here. But you have also information coming of the block A2. The first order trace is simply the sum of the real part of the eigenvalues, while the second order trace is exactly the information that you have, which enter into accounts with these elements of the second block A2. But still, OK, you need two traces. We can live with that. The first captured behavior of the real part, while the second contains the information on the module of the eigenvalue. Nevertheless, well, if your matrix was only on the complex, then in some sense, well, these two more or less to kind of look loose definition because you only have lambda zero and uh, well, the norm of the operator. But the problem now is how to compute them in terms of the entrance. The entrance, the trace of the, let me write again by blocks, the trace 
of the companion mattress. Remember that I have here the elements. Here I have the conjugate, but the real part is twice. So is simply the first order trace gives you the trace of the companion mattress. While the second order trace gives a formula that I'm not exactly happy with that, but um, yeah, it is what it is. Well, the second order trace gives an uglier form, but gives a form. So let's go, and I really have to accelerate, uh, go for an easy example. I choose here a nice mattress where the eigenvalues are visibly three plus i and ij. I wish all the mattresses were that simple. You can compute the characteristic polynomial for the companion, and you get a, a polynomial of fourth degree. Now you look at the coefficient of the linear term, minus six, and realize that it is symmetric of the trace, the first order trace of the original operator. You calculate this expression, module square, uh, square of the model of the first plus square of the model of the second for, well, uh, 10 plus one. And then you multiply for real time. But since the real part of that is zero, you simply get 11. And that is the second order trace of your original operator. Now, how this now is going to live when you are going to generalize this for arbitrary operators on HN. You use the notation of Grothendieck and simply describe as choosing a given base, describe the functionals associate to them, which is simply apply the adjoint of the operator to the element of the basis and construct these spaces associated to the companion matters. This is already well defined. And so you construct, it's another way of saying you construct your characteristic polynomial associated to the companion matters. Now you have again this formula and you have your trace of the companion. You have now a nice property that the trace of the product of matrix, the, uh, one, two, three, the companion of the product is the product of the companions, which is very nice, which means that when I have to calculate psi of a square of a, K minus one, et cetera. The only thing I have is to multiply these elements and I can establish the traces in terms of this matrix rather easy. The problem is that the trace I have is apparently and I put here a trace because originally this trace might be dependent of the base. So not exactly a trace properly called, but as it is written, it's simply the real part of this sum. And therefore it apparently looks to be dependent of the basis that you choose. But that was the nice surprise. When you do the calculations, you make, well, choose one other basis, A1, et cetera, AN. Make these calculations, compare the application AXY with AYX, and realize that because you only need the real part, 
The fact that they are not commutative is not going to affect. But still, careful, because you have order products and you have some tricky steps in the middle. But it's possible to show that is not dependent of the choice of the basis, and therefore it is an exact trace. Well, it is a trace point. And now let's pass finally for Hilbert modulus. I'm going to pick a separable right Hilbert model. And for the time being, I take a compact operator acting on this. So, if my operator is self-adjoint and compact, then I can describe it as in the classic case in terms of these elements with T lambda n being the eigenvalues. All is work, fine. And you have, again, kernel and span in terms of the eigenvalues, but careful eigenvalues defined by the class, the equivalence class. And for each representative element, you're going to find the eigenspace defined by this equation, Q lambda t applied to v equals zero. Each step you have to solve this resolvent equation, which is kind of unpleasant. But anyway, let's move forward. Now we pass by R nuclear operators in quaternionic Banach spaces. So the only thing I have are norms, not anymore in a product. I have norms and functionals acting on these elements. First, I'm going to say that this right Banach model has the approximation property. If I can, in a given compact, approximate the elements by an operator of finite rank. So in some sense, if I can reduce the things to case, well, an approximation by matrices. And then when this happens, your operator if it satisfies this condition that the series of the norm of the element power r, norm of the functional again power r being finite, then my operator can be described as the element with the functional acting on the element x that I want to evaluate. So you can introduce now semi-norms on this space, and you have, in particular, the usual norm. These norms are evaluated over all the representations that I have. And I'm going to say that this space that I'm generating here of all operators who can be written like that, with the seminorm norm R is called the space of R nuclear operators. One attention that you have to be careful, I, ah, yeah, I read it over there. My R is going from zero to one, which is slightly unpleasant. So this is not exactly, while the Schatten classes are for P larger than one, these R nuclear operators are for R smaller or equal than one. So anyway, when R is one, this coincide with the set of trace class operators if your Banach is on top of that a Hilbert space. And more important, this space dr inherits the approximation property. So, okay, then the class is precisely the, I think this is here a little bit, R-Schatten von Neumann, well, disregard this information, 
it's not necessary for what we are doing here. Now, we are going to extend, where was it? These monsters we have for the companion mattress, now for the case of these R nuclear operators. And in order to do that, I'm going first to define the K order trace as simply the operators where I use this expression. I put the tilde here because I not I haven't proved yet that is a trace in proper sense, which is two times all the possible sums of the action of the functional xm minus one on xm2, functional xm2 acting on xm3, and so on until the last acts on the first. This is a little bit messy notation, but comes from, um, I have to say Grothendieck was having a huge ability of working with algebraic structures and matrices. He could see symmetries where others see nothing, but uh, well, never mind my comment. Anyway, you have this element, which at first sight seems to depend on the basis that you choose. Still remember your XM is the action of this, okay? Now, you're going to try to define the trace and Fredholm determinants in terms of this element. So, you have a bounded linear operator on the Banach space, Banach space module, right module, Banach module, which has a representation in terms of this element in the dual, this, oh, it's written here, and this one, a basis for your element here. So these operators, then you can define a quaternionic determinant as the sum, infinite sum of these k order determinants and the trace is exactly the trace of first order. Still, I have to prove that they are indeed independent of the basis and the part comes, the trace does not depend of the choice of the basis that you have for the element, for the Banach. Well, let me call it space because call it model is not so usual. For the basis, for the module, for the Banach and for the dual of the Banach. But it's not in general true even when these series converge absolutely if A is a nuclear operator. So let's now go for the nice proposition. I have a Hilbert quaternionic module and I have an operator of trace class, which I can represent in my usual form. Then, I have this determinant, which is simply an alternated sum because of the minus sign of the K or the traces, which can be expressed in terms of the products of, again, this, which in the end will encode the module of the eigenvalue and his real part as information. And the coefficients of these k order traces do not depend on the orthonormal set, orthonormal basis that you're going to choose. And the trace of the operator correspond that to this 
first order trace that you have defined. And now, finally, we get to the quaternionic Banach space with approximation property that we can establish the traces in terms of the eigenvalues. The first order trace is simply two times the real part. You can now extend it to all the operators, provided that they are two thirds nuclear. That is the funnier part. You also have a complementar definition for the second trace operator in terms of the modules and the real parts of the eigenvalues. And the Fred Holm is now well defined in terms of that strange element that we have here, a second order equation. This is, uh, yep. That's the Grotendieck-Litsky. It's not only the, well, I have a lot of problems with sometimes saying strange names, but yes, that's the Grotendieck-Litsky formula for quaternionic Banach spaces. Now, the idea of the proof is always the same. You make a restriction to finite rank operators, or let's put it this way, you make approximation, you need the space to have a property of approximation, you approximate by finite rank operators. These are quaternionic Hilbert Schmidt operators over, these two should be on top. So this element is on trace class. And now is simply use the results for the Hilbert module case, and you have your idea finished. And uh, yes, I'm what? Nobody see. Now the sentence that I have always to put that I like it or not. Welcome to my part, and I'm open to questions. Sorry, I think I spoke too much. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Let me see in the chat, maybe. Okay, um, I have a question. Uh, have, the, have the quaternion operators some real applications? Maybe. Yes, they do. That's actually what we are trying to do next. Because that's, uh, no, 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 I'm going too fast. Where was it? Here. That's exactly this application in physics. Because, well, first you have already known this Minkowski space, where you know that the description of spaces with a more complicated, well, more complicated geometries require that you use quaternions. That's number one. But uh, it's coming up in physics more and more the problem that you don't really have an R3 nice property you have a geometry rather complicated, and that geometry sometimes is much, well, it's better described by a quaternionic setting. So, for instance, in quantum mechanics, that's a nice uh, application. And sorry, I got distracted because I was seeing somebody wrote, but was not a question in chat. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any question? I have other question. Instead of Bana spaces of a quaternionics, um, one, um, one can consider a octonions or other structure rings. Uh, and, and have similar uh, growth and no, 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 no. Let me go back to something I 
I made it sound very simple to jump from one to the other, that you are just multiplying, et cetera. But there is one problem. Remember when you jump from real to complex, you lose the order relation. When you jump from complexes to quaternions, you lose commutativity. So you are already seeing where this is going. You are going to lose something. And when you pass from quaternions to octonions, what you lose is associativity. And I can tell you, I don't know anyone who worked on quaternions who hadn't been beaten by, at one time or another, losing commutativity, using commutative where commutativity didn't exist. Now, if you don't have commutative and do not have associativity, you can imagine the hell. I have to say, I'm pretty coward. I'm trying desperately to avoid that case. I know there are persons working with octonians. I know that they are working in applications for numerics, but you still have one hell of a trouble because there is no associativity to work with those elements. And that is perfect hell to work with. Well, sorry. Okay, thank you, the, uh, Professor. Some other question? Okay, maybe I have a, I have a question, Professor Cerejeiras, about the theorem. Um, this, uh, this theorem that you presented at the end, um, yes, have you some uh, intuition what happens uh, if this theorem also is valid for R uh, from below of 2 over 3 or? or uh, below 2, 3, that's one problem we are actually looking because you have to play with the fact that your R nuclear, the R has to be between zero and one, while the nuclear, well, for the Schatten classes, you have to take the P larger than one. So probably would still apply for less than two thirds, perhaps, but I'm not sure. I really have to check how one thing translates with the other. For two thirds, for the moment, I'm sure that it works. The others work in the future. Okay, thank you. This two over three comes from this very impressive world of good authentic. So yes, uh, yes. interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. That man can give a depression when you are looking at his works, actually. <laughs> well, never mind. Sorry. Yeah, so thank, thank you. you very much for your talk. Uh, we are honored to have you here today. And it we was will an go in. Honor from my side. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> um, now we are going to start the break. We have one hour. And the next talk start at uh, 11 a.m. in Colombian hour, 6 p.m. in European summer time, and the next speaker uh, will be Rushansky. So, other interesting talk. <laughs> and see you. See you in one hour, I hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.
हेलो प्रोफेसर मे बी आई कैन एक्टिवेट योर माइक्रोफोन Oh, okay. Sorry, professor. Now. <laughs> No problem. Is it now Thank better? You. Now it's better. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Can you yes. see me? I can see you. I can hear you. Let's see. Let's see. Now, where's the presentation question? <laughs> can you see my screen? Yes, professor. I can see the screen. Um, no. Let's see. Full screen. Is it fine? It's very well, professor. Uh -huh. Very well. And <clears throat> can you see my mouse moving? I saw your mouse moving. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I don't use a, a, um, a laser pointer. Also, so it's rather. Okay. Well. So let's see. Uh, no. Can we try if the uh, the slice move? Yes, I'm just checking. Ah oh, well. So, oh, yeah, it seems to work, right? It seems that it's working. Yes. Yes, great. But I cannot see myself. But anyway, it's not a big ah. issue. Let's see. Uh, Maybe. So the point is when I do full screen, I only see my full screen, but I, okay. see my, I don't see myself. But this is not a big uh, issue as long as, um, but I am, am I visible uh, on your screen? If you want, I can go to your office because maybe you have an option to see yourself. Let, let me go to your office, maybe. Yeah, maybe. maybe. A, so it's uh -huh. lots of let, time left. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> let me just go uh, one minute. I will go. Yes, I, I'm in my office, yes. Yeah. All right. So not too bad. So at least the computer is working. Mm -hmm. So I did what I did is I took your window and then it was um, full screen. And if there's full screen, I just see this one. Yes. But I don't see myself. And if ah, I do escape, yes. I can come back. Well, it's, for me, it's not that important. Maybe you should first. Um... But maybe, uh -huh, maybe, maybe we can ask to the guys that are there. Let, let me ask to, yeah. to mm -hmm. Jessica. Puedes verme? Sí. Me escuchas, Jessica? Sí. En ese momento, ¿qué ves? Ves la pantalla completa compartida del profesor o no? Eh, sí, completamente. Completamente compartida. Oh, sí. sí, incluso se ve el profesor y se ve usted. Nos vemos, ah, no, o sea, se ve la pantalla también de, de, de nosotros dos, ¿verdad? Sí, sí. 
Es decir que esa pantalla es ideal para que él haga su presentación ahora en esta puede, forma. Puede decir, eh, eh, profesor, can you um, move your slices if maybe? Yes. Uh, so let's see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, perfect. Yeah, it it is working well. Yeah, but, but uh, this is now not full screen mode, right? Yeah, but it is full screen, and in one part I can see your face also, and also and, and see in, uh, the one. <laughs> yeah, but this is the optimal way, so to say, because I I just see on the right hand side myself and 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 some others, and the question is, and it's not full screen on my screen, but uh, yeah. oh. I think that it's not full screen. No, but the, the, the people is uh, for the people. It is full screen. Is for yes, the for the people is full screen. I see. Well, that's that's uh, that's nice. That's good. Yes. And that's for the rest, uh, uh, who can be seen? Is just me, or is just uh, all the others too? Just, uh, just you yourself. Just me and uh, and now uh, Divan, right? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly, good. Um, now, my talk starts at uh, seven. I don't know when Michael stops. Michael stops, uh, I, I think that two minutes before. Two minutes two before, minutes because, minutes before. Um, as you know, uh, there's a sort of transition and uh, everything should work out properly. So, okay. okay. But Duvan is in in case it is a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will ask Duvan to, to help out. But normally, so. Uh, the voice is working and the screen is working, so that's nice. Because uh, in the past, I had sometimes problems with the uh, uh, speaker. So, so the speaker was, for some reason, uh, not was, working. Okay. <clears throat> that is but, uh, inconvenient. But now we can hear very well to Professor Bayerman, yes? Yes, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. We can see you, we can see completely the screen, and we can hear you completely well. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Do, do you see this very nice library? <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of the things that is more <laughs> impressive of the. <laughs> Actually, most of the books are my own books. So it's yeah. really uh, not from the library, but uh, just private property. Private property. Yeah? <laughs> uh, so, well, I, I should not say. Well, most most books I bought via eBay and the secondhand bookshops, but uh, still. Still, it's convenient to have all them, and uh, uh, you see also some paintings in the background, right? So, uh huh. A very uh, nice library. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm happy with this. And, uh, okay. But any, anyway, I don't want to steal your time. I just wanted to check uh, the site the conditions, and they seem to be fine. So. Yeah. No, and you are not wasting my time. No, we are honored to help you. In what? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah. So. I hope that everything is okay on the slide. So I just uh, announced you under ICMAM 2022 in Latin America. So I, I was not aware of this precise uh, venue, so to say. So I did not uh, write too much there, but anyway, it should be fine, mm -hmm. I guess. I can see perfectly and there is enough uh, space from that last part with the screen. I see, that's good. Okay, then... Uh, See you again in uh, roughly two hours, so to say, or one and a half hour. Okay, Professor, thank you. See you. <laughs> See you.
Okay. Professor Ruchansky is here. Maybe you can activate your microphone. Hello. Hello. Okay, so maybe you can start sharing your screen. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I will present to Professor Ruchansky with some words in Spanish and later in English. And after that, uh, Professor Ruchansky uh, will continue with the presentation. Okay, buenos días para todos. Es mi placer introducir a un matemático ruso que ha estado conectado directa o indirectamente con la comunidad matemática colombiana, el Profesor Michael Ruchansky. Desde su visita como plenarista al Congreso Colombiano de Matemáticas en 2013, ha mantenido un vínculo cercano en especial con los matemáticos de la Universidad del Valle. En efecto, mantuvo una, una colaboración cercana con Julio Delgado, ahora profesor de la misma universidad, cuando ambos estuvieron vinculados al Colegio Imperial de Londres. Fruto de esa colaboración, el profesor Ruchansky ha contado entre su grupo de estudiantes de doctorado con tres estudiantes colombianos y un investigador postdoctoral egresado de la Universidad de Antioquia, en la Universidad de Gante, en Bélgica. A continuación, si me lo permiten, continuaré esta presentación en inglés en vista de la variedad de participantes que tenemos desde distintas partes del mundo. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce one of the most active analysts of our time, namely Michael Ruchansky, who now is the director of the Ghent Analysis and PD Center at the Ghent University. From his visit to Colombia, participating as a plenarist of the Colombian Congress of Mathematics in 2013, Michael has been connected in one way or in another with the Colombian mathematical community. It started with his collaboration with Julio Delgado when they were affiliated to the Imperial College of Science and Technology in London. Now, between his big list of doctoral students, three of them are from Colombia, from the Universidad del Valle, and currently he has a postdoctoral researcher graduated from the Universidad de Antioquia. He keeps his collaboration with many other colleagues from the Universidad del Norte and from Los Angeles, from Los Andes University. Professor Ruchansky studied at St. Petersburg State University from 1989. He born in Russia, a country of famous mathematicians like Kolmogorov, Arnold, Perelman, and Gromov. The country of famous musicians like Tchaikovsky, or of writers like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. With a master degree in 1995 in the Netherlands from 1993, he was first in the Mathematical Research Institute and then at the University of Utrecht. He obtained his doctorate under the supervision of one of the most brilliant geometricians ever, Hans Twistermatt, in 1998. His thesis, Singular Figuration with Affine Fibers with Applications to the Regularity Properties of Fourier Integral Operators, is now a masterpiece to whom wants to start in this idea. As a postdoctoral student, he was an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University under the supervision of Christopher Sock. From 1998 to 2000, he was a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, and from 2000 to 2006, he was lecturer at Imperial College London, where he became professor in 2010, and honorary professor since 2018. At the same time, he is professor at the School of Mathematical Science at Queen Mary University of London, and since 2018, he is senior full professor at the Department of Mathematics at Kent University. By his contributions in harmonic analysis and partial differential equations, he has been awarded with many prizes in recognition to his impressive mathematical career. In 2007, he was awarded with the Isaac Prize 
of the International Society for Analysis, his applications and computations. And in 2010, he was awarded together with Mitsuru Sugimoto with the Daiwa Adrian Prize. He has the record of having been awarded twice with the Ferran Sunger First Balarger Prize in 2014 and in 2018. And recently, he became the first mathematician in being a Methuselah laureate by the Ghent University. No less impressive that his Odysseus grant awarded in 2018 by the Flemish government. His service to the mathematical community includes to be member of the Management Committee Board for the Project Cost Action of Cooperation in Science and Technology of the European Union, board member of the Belgian Mathematical Society, and president of the International Society for Analysis, his applications and computations between 2009 until 2013, and board member of the same society from 2007. He's editor of more than 25 top mathematical journals of scientific research. He has organized more than 60 international conferences of mathematics. He has supervised more than 35 PhD students and more than 50 postdoctoral researchers. If you visit his website or you have, or you have been seen it during the past week, and it's not a joke, he has more than 300 papers. And he has written or edited more than or around 30 books in different topics in mathematics. So Professor Ruchansky, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce you in virtual form now in Colombia for this Latin American conference. So thank you, you can continue. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Devon, uh, for this um, introduction. Um, yes, it is a pleasure for me to give a talk at this um, Congress. I participated in it in a couple of uh, conferences in Colombia before and uh, had several visits. So <clears throat> now this time it's a virtual presentation. And uh, so here I chose a topic which is uh, somehow I've been doing for, for a while to try to give an overview, but also because it's a Colombian, well, it's a, it's a Latin American, uh, Latin American uh, Congress. So uh, this is a topic where I have been collaborating with several mathematicians from Colombia. So <clears throat> that's why I thought it is uh, maybe good to talk about this. Uh, it is, uh, uh, the, the title is uh, Sub-Elliptic Pseudo-Differential Operators at Compact Lee Groups. So we will be working on compact Lie groups and uh, looking at uh, pseudo differential operators of uh, sub elliptic sub elliptic type so here uh, it is uh, i can refer so th there are several works on this subject uh, so one which i will talk about uh, uh, is uh, this uh, paper with duan cardona and uh, somehow this uh, this is a continuation of uh, my previous work with uh, Ville Turunin and uh, uh, Jens Wirth and, and other people. Uh, it is a kind of sub-elliptic uh, sub version of that theory. And um, I should say that uh, um, it fills a gap somehow be between two theories that have been developed in the past. Uh, so we, we worked on different types of groups, uh, mostly compact groups and graded groups. And uh, we have a theory of pseudo differential theory uh, on compact groups, which is uh, uh, based on the properties of the Laplacian. Uh, on graded groups, we don't have Laplacian, we may have sub Laplacian, for example. So then the, pseudo, the corresponding pseudo differential theory is based on the sub Laplacian. But uh, here is kind of merging these two because we look at the compact Lie group and we we look at the uh, what what we look at the uh, pseudo differential operators uh, which are focused on the properties of the sub Laplacian. So this is a kind of general overview. So here maybe I, I give a couple of um, definitions and. Uh, recall a few things. So we are uh, working on Lie groups. So Lie group is a, is, 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 is a group. 
which is also a smooth manifold and uh, with the properties that the group operations are smooth uh, uh, mappings on, on in, in with respect to the manifold structure and uh, we can uh, we look at compact Lie groups there are on one hand there are many uh, because um, um, yeah, this is, uh, um, well, there are many for different, for many reasons, but uh, there are also, we can always think of them as matrices. And here are some examples. So the commutative group is the torus. Uh, there are linearly groups. Uh, and, and there are uh, also a particular case, which is uh, the case of SU2, which is uh, uh, diffeomorphic to, globally diffeomorphic to, to the three-dimensional sphere. And this is, uh, this gives away somehow to extend this analysis to from compact groups to other objects uh, because uh, one way is uh, here is a good occasion to mention the Poincaré conjecture proved by Perelman because we have a diffeomorphism between uh, uh, any closed connected simply connected three-dimensional manifold with three-dimensional sphere and then we can put a group product group group product on this on, on it uh corresponding through this correspondence here corresponding to the product of matrices in su2 so we can uh, artificially introduce a group product on a manifold and then we can develop a theory which is uh, based on this group product and uh, one of the advantages of uh, this approach is that uh, the, the the corresponding theory of pseudo differential operators gives us full symbols of operator uh, so compared with uh, hermander approach uh, where we recovered geometrically only the principal symbol. <coughs> Here, a big advantage is uh, that we have a full symbol, uh, which means that uh, we can uh, look at many properties which uh, depend on the uh, properties of full symbol. So if you look at the spectral behavior, if you look at the various PDs, then uh, lower the terms often play a role in these constructions. Uh, another way I should say is that uh, when we have a homogeneous manifold, we have a group acting on it. So we can have a smooth manifold with, a, with an action of a group, uh, in which case we can uh, look at this manifold as a quotient of group by a subgroup. And so uh, there is a way to, to, if you have now developed a pseudo, differ, diff, uh, pseudo differential theory on, 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 the, on the group, then we can factor it with a subgroup and then we can somehow uh, induce the, the, the corresponding construction which we develop on compact groups to also to homogeneous manifold. So uh, in this talk I will focus uh, just on, on uh, compact groups but uh, uh, one can always keep in mind that this is um, uh, the analysis can extend to further objects. Uh, so here maybe to start with some literature. So here this analysis uh, uh, goes back with uh, to 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 the joint work with Willa Turunen from uh, Finland uh, when we wrote this book. And uh, uh, so this work was 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 developed further with many co-authors. But uh, I should say that here the calculus is is somehow based on the Romanian. Uh, Romanian structure corresponding to the Laplacian, Laplace Beltrami operator. So here uh, in this work, well, in this recent development, we uh, the, the pseudo differential calculus that we will have will be uh, uh, based on the sub Romanian structure, uh, namely given by the by the corresponding to some sub Laplacian on this group. And uh, so here is as the machinery that we will use is is uh, basically goes back to this work with with, with Turunen, is uh, relying on the representation theory of the group because uh, uh, using representations of the group gives us uh, Fourier analysis, very well developed Fourier analysis, which we can then uh, uh, further use for for uh, the analysis of pseudo differential operators. Uh, so here I should also mention maybe uh, that uh, uh, so in this slide I put like um, on compact groups uh, so our intention is go from Romanian to sub Romanian structure but uh, uh, when we look at different groups so here to to finish with this um, review uh, I can mention uh, so nilpotently groups uh, 
um, here is a book with Veronique Fisher, and uh, which is uh, a version of this analysis on, on um, in the setting of graded groups. And uh, it can be taken further. So here uh, I can mention a paper with Barrios Montoya, which um, uh, extends some of these constructions to general locally compact group, uh, locally compact type one groups. Type one means uh, uh, in particular that we have uh, a nice Plancherel theorem and, and, and we have uh, quite meaningful Fourier analysis, rich Fourier analysis on such groups. But uh, uh, once we develop uh, ideas how to deal with such non commutativity, then uh, things can be also taken further. Uh, here I can mention three directions is, is uh, compact manifolds when we can construct uh, a pseudo differential theory uh, based on, on um, uh, spectral decompositions of some given operator. So this was uh, uh, initiated in this um, paper with uh, Julio Delgado. Uh, so we can uh, apply these ideas to boundary value problems, which we has, have done with Niastak Magombetov and uh, also this um, another works, um, another type of works with, uh, which I had with Ruana Kaljanov and, and Sean Majid. This is um, an extension of, of these ideas to uh, quantum groups and also to locally compact groups without this type one condition. But here we have to use, uh, instead of the Fourier analysis, in terms of representations, we use, uh, we can use the language of uh, Van Neumann algebras. Anyways, these are the, the related topics, which I will not uh, talk about here, but uh, uh, let me recall a few basic facts. So we have uh, pseudo differential operators uh basically the idea is uh, simple yet very powerful is that uh, we uh so we 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 look at the operators uh, on the fourier transform side and it can be shown that uh, if we take if we consider linear operators taking functions to functions for example uh, then um, under some very mild conditions uh, like continuity of this operator we can write it in the form of multiplication by a function on the Fourier transform side. So then, so here is the definition of the Fourier transform. And then uh, any operator A, basically almost any linear operator A can be written in this way, uh, where with some function sigma A, which is called the symbol of this operator. A. And then uh, one uh, looks what happens with these operators in uh, different uh, simple classes. There are really a lot of, uh, uh, different simple classes that have been considered, but the simplest one is uh, this one modeling polynomial behavior in Xi. So we have this uh, estimate uh, where the Japanese bracket of Xi is proportional to Xi. So then uh, um, we can mimic this idea on the torus, but uh, here we would uh, work with Fourier coefficients. And uh, again, we can show that any linear, any linear continuous operator on some spaces of functions can be written in this way. But here, the variable Xi is a dual variable for the torus uh, because we have a discrete basis of eigenfunctions uh, for the Laplacian. So here we, uh, I can mention the Laplacian. And, 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 and so any operator can be written this way. And then uh, the corresponding symbol class is, is uh, given by these conditions where delta Xi is a difference Difference operator on the torus, and uh, so this is uh, and here in fact one can show that uh, the results in class of operators uh, classes of operators are equal to each other. So uh, periodic operators with symbols like this in the first setting are exactly the same as operators uh, in the second setting. So this is just uh, shows to us that we can uh, do different quantizations, and we can study the same classes of operators in different ways. And, and here, this is uh, approach which, which was developed with uh, Vila Turunin is uh, on a compact Lie group, we uh, can use representations Xi uh, of the group to define Fourier transform. And then again, we have a similar formula for the quantization. And the question was uh, at that time, how to define good uh, symbol classes so that we get a nice behavior of the corresponding operators. 
so and and um, okay so i will i will be using representation theory a little bit very minimal in this work so let me uh, recall uh, a couple of a few definitions so we have um, uh, representations uh, so representation theory is a very powerful tool because uh, basically it's uh, uh, it's it's a way to analyze groups because we just uh, consider um, the action of the group on spaces of matrices um, and, and and we see what what the group structure is doing uh, in terms of multiplication of matrices uh, so uh, here one may say that uh, so we have representation xi which is an uh, uh, isomorphism which which is a mapping sorry which is a mapping from g to the space of linear operators on some space Hilbert space and um, uh, the property of representation is that it preserves the group structure psi of x y equals to the product of composition of psi of x and psi of y, and um, it turns out that uh, we don't have to look at all these mappings, uh, but it's enough to look at the unitary ones. So here, because I will mention also graded groups in this talk, I will uh, not. Uh, I, I, I will. I will. Uh, I give this definition in general. Uh, so. Uh, it's not only for compact groups, but then we uh, consider only, so there are two, still too many of them. We don't need all of them. So we consider the reducible ones, namely those which cannot be decomposed as uh, written as a direct sum of lower dimensional ones. And uh, uh, a nice property of compact groups is that uh, uh, if you consider this, if you look at this reducible unit representations and all of them are finite dimensional, and uh, so the, the Hilbert space where this uh, Xi X is um, finite dimensional and we can, uh, with the dimension D Xi, we can look at it as a matrix. So once we fix the basis in H Xi, then uh, it becomes a matrix. So we can think of representations as being uh, matrix valued uh, mapping, mappings from the group. So an example here is a torus where we consider uh, Simplest example is this uh, Xi case. This a uh, one-dimensional representation. They're all irreducible because, uh, well, we cannot obviously reduce them any further. So uh, we can think of them, of these functions as representations of the torus. And uh, the unitary dual is a collection of all these continuous uh, irreducible unitary representations modular some uh, equivalence relation, but it's not really important here. Uh, and because this, this said, G hat will play a very, very important role in, in, in the further analysis. Namely, we uh, define Fourier coefficients of a function uh, by this formula. So we take, uh, int we integrate F against Xi of X. And, 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 and for technical reasons, we put a joint. Uh, some people don't put, but uh, uh, here we put because we are maybe used to if, if you look at the torus and we, we, we see that we, we recover the standard Fourier transform here and, and, and so which comes with the minus sign. Uh, so now, uh, and in fact, this, this formula is, um, so this, this definition works not only for compact groups. So whenever we have uh, uh, representation Xi, uh, we, we, see, we see it as a mapping map on some Hilbert space. And in this way, the Fourier coefficient also becomes a mapping, uh, becomes an operator uh, on the Hilbert space H Xi. Uh, so, for, so this is um, the definition which I gave for Fourier coefficients and uh, we have a Fourier series. Uh, so um, again, in case of compact groups, uh, these two are matrices of the same dimension, so we can multiply them, but we want to recover the scalar function. So we take a trace and we get this nice formula. Um, nice formula uh, for the Fourier series. And uh, we can look at the further properties. We have uh, L2 products on the dual of G uh, so that we have Plancherel formula. So it's easy to check this equality. So we can uh, take this as a definition of L2 products. So we get L2 norm on, on G hat. And, and, and so we get a nice Hilbert space where the Fourier transform is, an, is, is, is now an isomorphism. Uh, there is another 
uh, important feature here is that uh, these representations, they connect well to the Laplacian, but also to the sub-Laplacian later. Uh, namely, if you take representation Xi, then uh, all of its, comp so it's a matrix, remember? If you look at the Xi IJ, then uh, all of these Xi IJ, they turn out to be eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator with the same eigenvalue. So with the same eigenvalue. So the, the, the uh, we can, uh, so which we can denote by lambda Xi. So, and then uh, we can define this Japanese bracket as, as uh, its normalized version because Laplace in second order. So we make it first order. And, and this is the way, so this Japanese bracket of Xi is, will be the way how we will measure uh, the growth properties of the Fourier coefficients. Uh, so the difference uh, with the sub-Laplacian, let me uh, say this already, so the sub-Laplacian is um, uh, sum of squares of vector fields, uh, but um, um, so it's, it's, it's uh, uh, we, 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 we require that these vector fields satisfy Hermann condition, namely if you look at the iterated commutators of these vector fields and we recover the whole uh, uh, Lie algebra of the, of the group and uh, uh, the step, the step of the group is is uh, the length, the maximum length of the commutators. Uh, how many commutators we need to uh, get to the, the to the full Lie algebra? Uh, so this uh, is uh, now sub Laplacian by because vector field satisfies Hermann condition. This operator is sub elliptic. It's hyper, hyper sorry. Uh, it's hyper elliptic, and uh, uh, it has. Um, also a nice property is that uh, the eigen uh, the representations are still eigenfunctions of this operator, but uh, the spectrum changes. Uh, spectral properties change a little bit because remember here uh, I said that uh, all these matrix elements of the representations are eigenfunctions with the same eigenvalue lambda xi. Here we may get different eigenvalues for different matrix elements, but um, because the operator is because the operator is um, um, symmetric, um, we can uh, yeah. So we can we can always um, uh, diagonalize it, and uh, it's, it's well. We, we can always diagonalize it's it's um, I mean, okay. Maybe maybe let me explain in a different way because I haven't introduced symbols yet. Uh, so the property, anyway, the property here is that it has discrete spectrum, and we denote this lambda, uh, the the, the uh, we denote this spectrum new ij. So then we have this property that uh, when we so uh, this new ij, they are the eigen 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 uh, values for the sub Laplacian, and uh, we can look at its uh, uh, matrix, the symbol. In the representation space, and then uh, because it's positive, we can diagonalize, diagonalize it, and we can think of this as a diagonal matrix. So the, the, the difference with the Laplacian is that in the case of the Laplacian, all of these uh, new I, i's would be equal to uh, just uh, uh, lambda xi squared, and would be equal to each other. Okay, so but now let me come back to Laplacian, but we can do these things also for the sub-Laplacian, so we can. Uh, uh, for example, we can um, um, characterize different function spaces on the Fourier transform side. So the Sobolev space, which is defined, let's say, in local coordinates, can be characterized globally by this formula. Smooth functions can be uh, characterized by the rapid uh, decay of uh, Fourier coefficients. So here is a matrix. So it is important uh, which uh, norm we take. So we, 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 we know that all norms are equivalent. On one hand, but on the other hand, uh, the constants in this equivalence in this equivalence of norms depend on the size of the matrix. And here, the size of the matrix is a dimension of the representation which goes to infinity. So, therefore, if you want to have uniform estimates, it's it's very important which norms we take. So here is we take Hilbert-Schmidt norm. Uh, here it doesn't matter because um, for smooth functions, for distribution doesn't matter. And uh, one can also talk about uh, BS of spaces. Uh, uh 
triple disorgan spaces, which was done in this paper, and also Javier spaces uh, with the Parajita Dasgupta. One can find uh, global version, global ca ca characterizations of uh, various function spaces on uh, on on the on defined locally on the group. But I think that uh, because my introduction was a bit long, so let me skip some technicalities. Uh, let me skip triple disorgan spaces and um, uh, come back to well, go straight to the to the, to the operator. So we have uh, a notion of Fourier multiplier. So here is just multiplication on the Fourier transform side, but uh, now the difference is that Fourier f hat of xi and uh, uh, so these Fourier coefficients are matrix valued. So we need uh, so the Fourier multiplier is given by the matrix sigma xi, and the Fourier inversion formula uh, gives us this uh, this representation of the operator. So because so we, one can show that such operators are all uh, left invariant, therefore we can write them as a convolution operators with the right convolution kernel, and uh, the symbol is nothing else as a Fourier uh, Fourier transform of the kernel. So there are many uh, operators, of course, of this way, of, of, uh, in this, uh, of this form. But um, the next step is, is when we come to the full theory of pseudo differential operators, then we let this sigma depend on x, so that the operator is not necessarily left invariant. Uh, and here, as I mentioned before, uh, we have, um, uh, we really cover, uh, this approach really covers a lot of operators. So if you consider linear continuous operator from, from, from smooth functions to distributions, then uh, we can define a symbol by this formula here. We apply A to the matrix Xi, xi component wise, then we multiply by the adjoint matrix. Uh, then we get uh, sigma a x xi, which is a full symbol of the operator. And then there is a theorem that uh, the operator a can be recovered by this formula with a sigma sigma with a symbol sigma a here. So basically, uh, uh, it gives us a nice uh, quantization formula, which uh, with a symbol sigma a being matrix valued, because um, well. Uh, by the way, is defined as matrix valued, and it contains uh, the whole information about the operator. So uh, this is, um, from this point of view, it is an advantage with, uh, compared to the Hermander approach, where only the principal symbol is recovered. Here we uh, have the full information about the operator in this symbol. So um, yes. So now we we can talk about symbol classes. And uh, for symbol classes, we uh, uh, have to do something on the on the uh, dual G hat. And uh, we uh, introduce a notion of difference operators. So this we have introduced uh, with, uh, in our book with uh, Vila Turunin and then uh, uh, modified it a bit further with in, in the paper with um, Jens Wirtz. Uh, so the, 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 the definition is very simple. Uh, we can see that, so this, this is different separate is an operator acting on Fourier coefficients by this simple formula that if you take a function Q smooth vanishing in the unit element of the group, then we define delta Q of hat to be a Fourier transform of QF. And we can recover so many things. So this this definition works uh, well on um, many groups. It actually also work, can be can be uh, made uh, can be also work well can also work on, on on general manifolds without group structure with some modifications. But uh, here we talk about groups. Here just let's see that the the, the usual derivatives in the case of Rn, the usual derivatives are recovered in this way as a difference uh, with respect to this function minus xj. So this is a smooth function vanishing at, the, at, 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 at zero. And uh, because of this formula here, we see that uh, on the right-hand side, we have a difference operator. On the left-hand side, we have derivative, and they are equal. Uh, on the torus, we have to modify because modify this a bit because the function xj is not smooth uh, on the torus. But 
it's not periodic, but if you make make it like this in the, with the exponentials, then it's smooth. Vanishes. We have to subtract one so that it vanishes the identity. And then when we calculate the corresponding difference operator, we recover nothing else but the uh, usual difference operator on, on the lattice ZN. Um, so this is, um, and then we have like, um, when we work with, let's say we work with derivatives, we want to have derivatives in all directions. So here we want to have the same property. And then we, this is a bit technical definition is that uh, uh, we consider a family, we say it's strongly admissible if uh, basically each of them is, is a different separator and there are enough of them. So the rank of this matrix is, is, is uh, this matrix has a full rank. And also there is some non-degeneracy that's the only uh, join common set where the vanish is, is, is the unit element of the group. Uh, so uh, whatever, if you, if you, um, don't want to understand this definition, just think of this as uh, the, the properties that we have enough of them and they don't, uh, and, and, and somehow they are uh, independent of each other. So we don't have uh, anything, we, 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 don't, we don't have more than, than we need. And uh, here we can, uh, so with these notions, we can uh, talk about simple classes. So the simplest, maybe raw delta simple class is, uh, given by this formula. So we apply derivatives in X, differences in Xi. This is a matrix. So we measure this in, it, one has to measure this in the operator norm. And then we control its growth by the uh, Japanese bracket of Xi, which is remember was uh, proportional to the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. And, and, and with this nice class, we have uh, this theorem that uh, uh, if we introduce this class and we recover uh, the Hermanda class defined in local coordinates. So this is a usual pseudo differential class on uh, pseudo differential operators of order M on G, where G is considered as a manifold without any group structure uh, locally. Uh, so this is uh, operating in this class. It's if and, only, if and only if the symbol is in this class with uh, rho delta equal to one zero. So this gives a very nice link between uh, uh, Hermanda theory of pseudo differential operators and also these uh, matrix valued symbols that we uh, we were developing here. Uh, so then we can uh, let me give you a few examples. So already this allows us to answer some uh, interesting questions. So in this theorem uh, with Jan Swirt, we proved uh, Her Michelin Hermanda version of the uh, LP multiplier theorem. Uh, namely, if we put um, these derivatives, these differences, so I, I, I write here this D in this way, because here we take a particular family of different separators, but it's not really important here. So this is an analog of the Michelin uh, uh, multiplier theorem is that if we consider these differences up to order kappa, where kappa is bigger than half of the dimension of the group, then the corresponding operator uh, now it's a Fourier multiplier because simple doesn't depend on X, is bounded in LP. And uh, one can also extend this to rho delta classes, but um, uh, rather than give you uh, some uh, more complicated extension, let me give a couple of nice examples. Uh, so the sub Laplacian, on, so on, on, on S3, which is, uh, as I said, it's, it's equivalent to SU2. We have uh, three vector, so the Laplacian is given as a sum of three squares of three vector fields. The sub Laplacian is given as a sum of squares of two vector fields. And uh, it turns out that the uh, sub Laplacian has a parametric in this class. And, and, and I should say that this class now is well defined. While if you use Hermander approach, then uh, uh, this class doesn't have geometric meaning because you need, uh, when, you put, when you put here uh, rho and delta, you need rho bigger than, strictly bigger than one half. So uh, there is locally, you cannot keep track of this operator, but globally it works fine. Uh, it is in this class. And therefore we, from this uh, Michelin uh, multiplier theorem, we immediately get some a priori estimate for this operator. We can also do it for other operators, but uh, uh, what is even more remarkable, I think uh, is an example when we consider vector field plus a constant. Uh, this is 
not covered by Herbanda sum of squares because there is no there is no sum of squares here. It's 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 first order operator, and uh, moreover, its properties depend on lower terms. So as you see here, the, uh, again, um, it's not enough to study this operator. It's not enough to work with the principal symbol because uh, many of its properties, spectral properties, depend on the lower terms, which is a lower term, which is constant. And one can uh, easily show that this operator is invertible if and only if I see is not half an integer. In this case, we can show that the inverse is in the symbol class zero zero zero, and 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 consequently we get an LP estimate. So these kind of examples uh, we um, uh, uh, have this uh, pretty in a pretty easy way. We get this LP estimate, but um, here we use this um, the theory that which is so this is an example where the theory becomes effective. So, uh, but now, now uh, uh, let me contrast this with a, with a, let me contrast this theorem with a sub elliptic version. So here, uh, this xi, Japanese bracket of xi, these are eigenvalues of the Laplacian. But now let's say if we com start comparing it with, not with Laplacian, not with the spectral properties of the Laplacian, but with sub Laplacian. Uh, so for sub Laplacian, this, um, uh, we cannot take this eigenvalue. Uh, so, so the question is what to put here. So the, 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 the trick is that we uh, put this xi to the power minus alpha to the left hand side, and we think of this as a symbol of the Laplacian. And and then if we do this, then we recover, then we can have the corresponding sub Laplacian version of this, namely, uh, so remember m hat of xi, so maybe I remind you the definition. So M, M of Xi is just the, is a symbol of the sub Laplacian. And uh, if you put the symbol of the sub Laplacian here, then uh, we obtain an analog of the michelin hermann theorem. So namely, if, it, if, if enough of these derivatives uh, enough of these differences uh, up to half of the dimension are bounded with respect to the eigenvalues of the sub Laplacian, then the corresponding operator is bound in LP. And, and, and here what we have is that uh, uh, somehow, uh, yes, maybe here is this, this uh, interesting feature is that this kappa here is a step of the group. And uh, so remember how many commutators we need. And this this uh, uh, variable kappa is, is 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 half of the dimension. Anyway, let me move on. So uh, I don't think I have much time left. So let me uh, move a little bit to the LP estimates for for pseudo differential operators. And uh, uh, here, a famous result is by Charles Pfefferman, uh, who proved. Uh, LP boundedness of uh, pseudo differential operators in rho delta classes uh, on Rn. And here in this work with uh, Julio Delgado, we proved a, a version of this uh, theorem uh, on compact, uh, on compact uh, Lie group. So G is a compact Lie group. Uh, C symbol sigma is a, a pseudo differential operator of type rho delta of order minus m. Then the operator is bounded on LP provided that uh, M is given by this uh, by this number. So this number, uh, I, will, I, will, I will show you several versions of the theorem, but here this number is uh, uh, the same number as you have in Rn, where N is the topological dimension of the, of the space of, of our group. Um, okay, so this is LP estimate for pseudo differential operators. Maybe I, I yeah, so let me just here uh, as a kind of commercial, short commercial uh, to refer to these, group, to these books, which is, uh, this is a book with Willy Turunen on the right about compact groups. On the left is a uh, uh, counterpart, is, 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 is a book with Veronik Fischer, which is open access, which is a theory of these operators on important groups, uh, because I want to show you a few, I skip definition of graded groups, if you permit, 
because uh, I think I'm uh, I don't have so much time. Let me just go back straight to the uh, to these results. Yes, so so this this is uh, a version of the result which I just showed before. Uh, so this is with Juan Cardone and Julio Delgado. This, uh, this is a counterpart of the previous result uh, where we are on uh, graded groups. So these are nilpotent groups, uh, which one can think of the Heisenberg group, for example, stratified groups and so on. And then uh, this is a counterpart analogous theorem, but uh, so if, if you have a symbol in the S rho delta type of order minus M, then the operator is bound in LP provided the time is bigger than this number. And the difference, you see the difference is that uh, in the previous theorem, here we have Q, which is a homogeneous dimension of the group. But in the previous theorem, we had N, which was a topological dimension of the, of the uh, compactly group. So we see this Q somehow is, is, uh, is bigger than the, the, the topological dimension. And uh, this is interesting. Well, this is, there are many things which one can say about this, but uh, uh, let me just mention here that there are, so this is actually quite uh, recent, uh, well, relatively recent uh, activities because uh, we have, so I show here LP, LP estimate, but um, we have other versions, so I can, uh, so on graded groups, I don't talk much about graded groups, but I show this because um, there is something which we will have for the sub-Laplacian on compact groups, which will, will be very similar to the case of graded groups. But uh, let me just mention that uh, we have on graded groups, we have um, various results. So here uh, with Veronique Fischer, we had uh, also a version of <coughs> for Fourier multipliers. So michlin hermander theorem on graded groups. Then uh, this paper with Hong and Hu, uh, this, um, um, Michlin Hermander theorem was extended uh, from the scale of LP spaces to Hardy spaces. Then uh, here with Duan, we also have a um, paper on the uh, multipliers on, 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 uh, on Fourier multipliers on graded groups, but in triple Zorkin spaces. So this is an extension of LP result. And then one can also talk about LPQ Fourier multipliers and uh, rather general results uh, I have done on, on, on locally compact groups uh, with Ruana Kuljanov and then uh, somehow completed in the case of graded groups with David Trottensteiner, uh, where we have um, rather complete understanding of LPLQ multipliers on graded groups. But uh, I will not talk about these things I just mentioned here, but uh, let me just, uh, the, 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 my point is that uh, uh, with this analysis, uh, with these techniques, it's interesting. One can study different questions, and uh, it provides uh, a lot of powerful tools how to, to deal with these problems. So now let me say, uh, let me come to the sub-Laplacian, which is uh, the sub-Laplacian compact groups, which is the main subject of this talk. So we have sub-Laplacian L, and uh, we define a symbol class now uh, suited uh, based on the sub-Laplacian. And the, 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 the uh, definition, if you recall, before we were taking these derivatives and differences, and we were estimating this by powers of the uh, of Japanese bracket of Xi, which means uh, powers of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So here we do the same thing. We uh, want to, take these derivatives and differences, and then we want to estimate it in terms of uh, uh, powers of uh, eigenvalues of the sub-Laplacian, but because uh, we had this uh, small problem that uh, different, uh, different uh, matrix entries of representations could give us uh, and give us different eigenvalues. So that what happens is that we consider the symbol we put here, we put, uh, the, the, the symbol of the Laplacian or in sub, of the sub Laplacian in this case inside, and then we write an estimate in this way. We write the definition this way. So this is exactly, if you know the, this exactly what um, the definition which uh, we used with uh, Veronique Fischer to, uh, for the pseudo differential theory on graded groups. So we just put this inside 
And then this gives us definition of the symbol class. And uh, it turns out that uh, I will show you some properties of the symbol classes. Um, I can say that in the case of L, if L is equal to the Laplacian, if in the case when L is a Laplacian, then uh, this M, M, M hat of Xi is, is scalar, uh, equal on the diagonal with is a scalar matrix, uh, equal to the um, just Japanese bracket of Xi, then we can take it out from the supremum and then we recover the previous class. So this is an extension of the of the setting for the Laplacian. And uh, here we have, uh, let me just go briefly over the, the main properties. So we have a nice class. So this gives us a nice class of symbols and the operators we have, and we have the usual properties that we expect from the calculus. If you consider two pseudo differential operators with symbols in these classes and the composition is in the class of order M1 plus M2, the adjoint of on operator is in the same class. Uh, there is a link with the uh, uh, Calderon Zygmunt theory. The same in, in, in the case of in the case of uh, uh, pseudo differential operators uh, corresponding to the Laplacian, uh, because we have shown that that the class which we introduce. Uh, is equivalent to the Hermander class. Uh, this gives a direct link to the direct link to the direct linked with the classical Calderon Zygmunt theory. So here uh, there is a small difference: is that uh, it is still Calderon Zygmunt theory, but it is in the sense of Kaufman and Weiss of spaces of homogeneous type. Uh, we have uh, basically we have good kernel estimates uh, for depending on the order of the operator and and Q. So let me, uh, uh, there is, it's not defined, but Q. So this is, this is a Q, which will be important, but let me come back to this Q. Let me come back to this Q. Uh, so uh, here is, uh, so Q is, 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 is uh, let's, let me say for now that it's, it's, it's a Hausdorff dimension uh, corresponding to the sub Laplacian, but let me, uh, talk more about this when I go to the LP theorem. Uh, but just to show that we have, uh, so we have uh, in these classes, we have the usual asymptotic expansions, which work well, we know already from the previous works. But now that the, we know that we have the asymptotic expansion, but now we can check that it uh, fits to the to this new symbol classes. Uh, we have composition. We have composition formula. Again, it's not surprising that we have the same composition formula. This is to ex be expected, but we have the good remainder estimate again in these classes corresponding to the sub Laplacian. And uh, and here is a, a theorem, which is uh, a version of this uh, Pfefferman theorem about row delta classes. Uh, again, uh, operators are bounded in LP provides the time is bigger than this number. And this is Q, which I, uh, which you saw before, this is a Hausdorff dimension. So basically the construction is the following. We have Hermann system of vector fields. Uh, so we can consider uh, the distance defined by this vector field. So we consider the, the, for, for any two points, we, uh, we uh, connect them by paths with tangent vectors in the space uh, spent by these vector fields. So this gives us the Carnot Carterior distance, and uh, with respect to this Carnot Carterior distance, our manifold G has a dimension which is called the Hausdorff dimension, and this is Q. So in the case of uh, so this this is bigger than uh, in the case of Laplacian, this uh, coincides with the topological dimension, but uh, otherwise it's bigger. In the case of SU two, for example, the topological dimension is or three dimension. In the case of three dimensional sphere. Let's say topological dimension is three, but uh, Hausdorff dimension is four. So here we have this. So here, uh, an interesting thing is that uh, uh, if we compare all the theorems, and here is uh, again, it's not topological dimension; it is a is a Hausdorff dimension. And 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 uh, it's, it's some in some sense it's not surprising because if you think of the Hausdorff what is the Hausdorff dimension of graded groups, then we get exactly the homogeneous dimension uh, of the group. So this is uh, that's why. We denoted by the same letter Q. And so just to uh, give some properties, so we have a calderon Vancour theorem, which is uh, a boundness of operators on L2, of, of uh, operators with symbols of order zero. 
And uh, there is an interesting uh, thing here is that uh, usually uh, in, in, in such theorems, um, let's say in the, in the standard setting, we have delta strictly less than one, but here delta is strictly less than one over kappa, where kappa is a step. So we have sub apply, we have Hermann vector fields, we have a step, and then this restriction is uh, less than one over kappa, where in the case of Laplacian, uh, kappa is equal to one. So this is the usual Calderon Venkur theorem. So we have the uh, we have the spectral calculus. Uh, so in particular, so the, for example, the, the power, we can take powers of these operators, uh, which is, uh, which will belong to the uh, symbol classes, which we, which we expect them to belong. Uh, so we have the, um, so for, for we, we, we can, so this, this, we have quite full, um, uh, spectral calculus so if you consider the function of operators if you consider the function of symbols then uh, they belong to the uh, under nice conditions of the symbols they belong to the suitable uh, symbol classes and the same uh, functions of operators belong to the corresponding uh, symbol classes for operators and this is uh, so with Jan Swirt quite uh, a few years ago we've done the, we've developed this uh, calculus for the for the uh, for the elliptic pseudo differential theory, the one that we had with Turunin, but here it is uh, in this work we have done we have done this for this uh, so an, an analogous construction to this paper, but uh, with some differences because we have to take the uh, into account that the, the, the symbol classes correspond to the subplasia, and uh, so let me say that uh, so once we have the spectral calculus we have uh, some nice results like Gordon inequality. Again, it's kind of a sub elliptic version of Gordon inequality because this is a Sobolev space uh, corresponding to this sub Laplacian. We can apply Gordon inequality to the well posedness of the Cauchy problem. And we have uh, uh, the sharp Gordon inequality, uh, which is uh, uh, stated here. So we have this kappa, which is a step. Again, if kappa is equal to one, then we just get delta less than rho, and if kappa is equal to one, we could just get uh, uh, the usual order here, but uh, it's just rho minus delta, but uh, here it is, uh, so if, if if kappa is equal to one, if in the elliptic theory, we had this result with, again, with Willy Turunin, uh, well, it's ten year, more than 10 years ago, but now we have this, uh, well, it seems to be exact, uh, uh, Ten, 10 years later, we uh, obtain this result for this uh, sharp Gordian inequality for the sub elliptic classes. And uh, so, just I think I'm um, running out of time. So, let me just be very brief that uh, these techniques can be used to study questions of uh, spectral geometry. Um, so, we can look at the uh, trace expansions of uh, functions of. Um, well, trace expansions of operators. Uh, so these two types, and these are the, the classical tools uh, which um, allow one to look at the some object, object, objects of non-commutative geometry, such as uh, Dix-Mir traces, uh, Vazitsky residues, and so on. So we, in particular, we recover them in this way. And uh, so to, to summarize uh, the last slide, uh, so to summarize what we have here, uh, so we have... Um, uh, symbol classes corresponding to the sub Laplacians now on, on compact groups. Uh, they uh, um, have all the properties, uh, like we can take a joins of them. They behave, behave well under joins, transposes. Uh, we have notion of ellipticity, hyperellipticity in this class. We have uh, functional calculus. We can construct parametrices. Uh, they are this uh, operators linked to the calderon zygmunt theory, but in the sense of Kaufman and Weiss, as I said, we have calderon Weinkur theorem uh, with an interesting twist that uh, step of the group enters here. Um, so we can, um, uh, so in, 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 in effect, this, so this, this theory, I should say that this theory runs parallel to two things. It par runs parallel to the uh, 
elliptic theory that I had with uh, Turunen in the sense that we are on complete groups, we have the same expressions for symbols, but it's also parallel to the theory on graded groups because um, uh, there, because we are working with the sub Laplacian. But there are, of course, big, quite big differences because uh, on, on, on uh, here, advantage is that we have compactness compared to graded groups. Uh, so we are working with matrices rather than operators. But on the other hand, in, in, in the analysis on graded groups, we, we relied a lot on properties of dilations, dilations on the groups that we have here, we don't have. So there are technical, uh, so technically these theories are parallel, but there are some, there are differences between them. So we have this uh, uh, sharp Gordian equality, which I mentioned. So these are main properties that we want to have from the, main first properties that we want to have from calculus. And uh, we have a bunch of uh, michelin hermander theorems on different spaces. And uh, as I said, there are also further works uh, relating this to uh, how to calculate indices of operators and some things in non-commutative geometry was this key residues expressed, was this key residue in, in, expressed in terms of representation theory of the group and so on. So I think that, uh, sorry if I went uh, over time, but uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ruchansky. So uh, we are open for questions. Okay, maybe. Maybe uh, Julio, maybe. Okay, maybe Julio. <laughs> Julio, maybe you can un uh, activate your microphone. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Michael. Very interesting. Uh, it's a, a standard review on many results. Yeah, thank you. Then, uh, if, if maybe if, if you can give some insights, some ideas on what can be done on, 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 on close manifolds something related to some of these uh, results. Uh, I know that there, is, uh, there are some obstacles, but maybe you can give some ideas. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a good uh, that's a good question indeed, because um, on, on compact manifolds, uh, so of course one wants to, uh, uh, in, in, in um, in 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 a way, one one wants to, with all these ideas, one uh, may want to eliminate the group structure and 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 make an analogy of the theory, global theory, global quantization theory on on, on compact manifold on let's say, on manifolds, let's say compact manifolds. But then uh, there are there are two approaches basically, uh, but. Um, Based uh, use, using the the spectral decomposition, so we, we, we fix a Laplacian, then uh, this Laplacian has a, the, the spectral decomposition, and then we build a pseudo differential theory based on the uh, uh, how this um, uh, operator transforms uh, x on the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So if if, if we, uh, uh, we we can think of um, the transformation of the uh, eigenspaces of the Laplacian, this can be viewed as a symbol, the matrix of the transformation of eigenspaces of the Laplacian can be thought of as a, as a symbol of the operator. But then we uh, run into two problems because uh, we can um, uh, you, we, we can look at the transformation of individual eigenfunctions or we can look at the transformation of eigenspaces. So if you, if you do this with eigenfunctions one by one, then uh, this is a theory that has been developed. Uh, we call it non-harmonic analysis, but then uh, we use we lose some properties because we uh, use we lose a little bit of the we, we lose some property. It's not ideal theory because we uh, uh, lose uh, uh, some um, geometric 
properties because we uh, don't group eigen functions into eigen spaces and then uh, so we destroy uh, a little bit some of the spectral properties so i i, I would say this is not ideal theory I, ideal uh, from this point of view but on the other hand if we group them together and we look at this symbols and transformation of eigen spaces and uh, indeed we have a good we have good results about uh, uh, about uh, uh, spectral about about uh, invariant so-called about Fourier multipliers in this case but we don't have a theory of pseudo differential operators so we while we can we have many things related to symbols uh, which do not depend on x but once we have uh, symbols depending on x then we don't have a theory uh, we don't have symbol classes and it's uh, very interesting I would say still very interesting open problem okay thank you very much professor Julio we have a question but uh, by Tanya, but maybe we are over the time because our nice speaker is here, Professor Bayerman. So maybe Tanya, you can uh, write to me uh, your question and then I will forward the question to Professor Ruchansky, okay? By email? Yes, my pleasure. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so, thank okay. You. Thank you, Professor Ruchansky. Uh, so now we have Professor Bayerman. Um, Brian, you can continue. Okay, good afternoon. Hi, Professor Bayerman. Can you hear me? Yes, I can do. Okay, nice to meet you. Uh, you can share your screen now. And then I, yeah. I, will, I will give a little presentation or a little Can speech. you see uh, the screen? So I yes. now do full screen. <clears throat> yes, we can. So is it readable? Yeah. And can you hear me? That's fine. Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Let me just give a, a little words before you start with your with your presentation. Uh, on this occasion, I'm a, I am pleased to introduce Professor Andreas Bayerman, who is an expert in logic, set theory, combinatorics, and discrete mathematics. In his extensive research career, he has published 79 articles and received countless awards. Bayerman is currently the, edit the editor of the Springer series Trends in Logic and a professor at the University of Ghent. But I cannot introduce Professor Bayerman without talking about two of his not scientific passions, chess and painting. In 2014, he joined the Rui Lopez Royal Ghent Chess Circle. In his youth, he published three chess problems in a refereed chess journal, which can be found on his personal website. Uh, seeing his paintings, it is easy to see that Professor Bayerman is not only talented at maths. Welcome, Professor Bayerman. We thank you for accepting our invitation. And you can start. Ah, um, if you want to, for chess lovers, if you want to, to try to solve the the chess problems uh, you can look at the personal wave website of professor Bayerman. go ahead yeah thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction and thank you much for inviting me to this conference so um, the talk will be about mathematics very simple mathematics which is motivated from questions in logic but for this talk, it is not necessary to have any idea about foundations of mathematics or logic. So I will speak about a classical result in analysis, but just a very basic one. So you don't need a uh, deep knowledge about analysis. Then we'll speak about bolzano weierstrass So what is this? Well, everybody in the audience will know about this. So we consider the closed unit interval and an infinite sequence of real numbers in this interval. And then we all know that there exists a converging, converging subsequence. Well, that's uh, a bachelor one, first semester. And well, of course we know how the proof goes, namely we do bisection. So we look, we divide the interval into two halves and we look in which interval, in which sub interval infinitely many uh, numbers are left. And uh, then we iterate it. Uh, we take this interval with infinitely many uh, members of the sequence 
and we uh, take another half of it, which contains infinitely many points, and then we iterate, and then by the usual arguments, we find uh, that the result is true. Even simpler is the monotone conversion, uh, convergence theorem, namely if we have a bounded increasing sequence of real numbers, then this also has a limit. And now we concentrate on the closed unit interval. And so the monotone convergence theorem follows from the bolzano weierstrass theorem, but in some sense, it's a bit easier. So the same conclusion. So we have a sequence in the unit interval increasing, and then there is a converging subsequence. Now, in this talk, I speak about uh, Harvey Friedman. Harvey Friedman is a genius in logic, so he became professor in Stanford in the age of 18, and he was somehow able to squeeze out in very interesting results out of classical results in mathematics. So first we start with some easy modification of the bolzano weierstrass principle. So again, we start with an infinite sequence of real numbers in the unit interval. And then there exists a subsequence. So there exists a sequence of indices K1 smaller than K2, et cetera, such that the distance between uh, two elements, X, k i plus one and x k i plus two is smaller than one divided by k i square. Now it's important that there are three consecutive elements in the sequence and um, now this is easy to prove, namely uh, by Bolzano, standard Bolzano Weierstrass, we find a subsequence of the given sequence which converges to a limit. And once we have a limit, we can construct these indices by simple recursion. So I will not do this, but this is a sort of easy student exercise. Now, the question which I want to answer in this talk is, how is this theorem connected to the following? Namely, uh, there's an old theorem by Abel, by Niels Hendrik Abel, about integration of uh, logarithmic functions. So let log index D denote the default iteration of the log function. Now, we all know if he takes the integral uh, about the real numbers of one divided by x time log, log of x times log of log of x, and we iterate and we take a finite iteration of logs, this is a divergent integral. Moreover, we take the last term to the one plus epsilon, it suddenly becomes converging. And now, in this talk, I will answer the question how the theorem by Abel is connected to the modified bolzano weierstrass principle. For this, we uh, refer to an interesting result by Harvey Friedman. So here's a painting of mine of Harvey Friedman. And uh, well, we don't have to look too much into the painting, but we have to look into this theorem. The theorem itself does not speak about infinite sequences, but about long finite sequences. And that's the point. It says this is a so-called miniaturization of bolzano weierstrass And it's somehow complex and it's difficult to digest because there are many quantifiers involved. So we start with a given number k, at least as big as three. And then there will be a rather big number m, such that uniformly for all sequences x1, x2, xm, the sequence of length m of elements in the unit interval, there exists a subsequence of length k, so k1 smaller than k2, smaller, smaller than k in this couple k below m, such that uh, this inequality xkr plus one minus xkr plus two, uh, this is the absolute value is smaller than one divided by ki square. So this is somehow similar to the modified bolzano weierstrass principle, but now we move from the infinitary sequence to a uniform bound for finite sequences. And the question is, uh, how does M depend on K? So here is again the theorem. <clears throat> now the question is, why is this true? And it follows by an application of compactness. So the proof, itself of the theorem is by Harvey Friedman. So 
how we can we proceed? Well, by the modified bolzano weierstrass theorem, we find that for every sequence x in the Hilbert cube, there exists the number m and k integers below m with the desired inequalities. Now we take Vm, an open set in the Hilbert cube, consisting of the set of points in the Hilbert cube for which we can find these k indices below m. This is an open set, and it covers the whole, the whole space. And, so, and then by compactness of the Hilbert cube, the theorem by Tikhonov, this open cover has a finite subcover. Moreover, the Vm from a monotone sequence of sets with respect to the subset relation. So there's some number m covering the whole space, and that's the number m. So that's a, a nice proof. Now the question is how big is m depending on k? Now we go back to another uh, famous function in the foundations of mathematics. It's the so-called Ackermann function, and this function is known for having a, a very quick growth. So by double recursion, so by the recursion on M and subsidiary recursion on N, we define the following thing. Actually, it's uh, wrong what I've written here. So by recursion on N and subsidiary recursion on M. So anyway, A0 is the successor function. And if you define a n plus one, I assume that a index n is already defined. So a n plus one of zero is a n of one. So this is defined by recursion. And a index n plus one of argument m plus one is defined by subsidiary recursion on m. And we assume that uh, what is this here? It's also wrong. I'm sorry for this. So I have uh, to, to change here now the indices. So the correct version is I have to take A index N of A index N plus one of M. I'm very sorry for this, but uh, I cannot correct this mistake because I have this on the slide. So I have to adjust this. Anyway, A index N plus one of M plus one is A index N of A index N plus one of M. And then I use the subsidiary recursion for defining A index N plus one of M. And then I plug this into the main recursion of A N. Anyway, if one defines it correctly, then uh, for every fixed N, the function M goes to A N M is primitive recursive, but the diagonal function M goes to A M M is not primitive recursive. Well, this just means that uh, in some sense, this diagonal function is growing rather quickly. Now, why is this interesting? Uh, computers are not able to calculate numerical values of concrete numbers. So A index five of 64 is so big. So this function is computable. You can write a program for it, but you will never ever by a computer find a numerical value of this uh, number here. The reason is uh, this number is very big. So it's bigger than the number of atoms in the universe and you are not able to print it on the screen. Now, what's the result by Harvey Friedman is that uh, the least number M depending on K for this uh, miniature, miniaturized version of bolzano weierstrass exceeds values of the Ackermann function. So we have A index K minus eight as a first argument. So this K minus eight is the lower index over here. So mk exceeds a index k minus eight of 64. And uh, m13 is a number, which is a concrete number, but it is so large that you cannot compute it in the real world. Uh, the number mk is bounded below by the Ackermann function, but there's also an upper bound in terms of a similar Ackermann function. So the Ackermannian type is the right description. Now, in my talk, I speak about the, what is called phase transition. So the question here is what happens if we estimate our estimate one over ki square to some smaller growing function? Do we still obtain a quickly growing bounds on mk or not? Now, any strictly positive function of ki will make the statements 
correct. But the question is, what is the size of the associated uh, numbers MK? And uh, first result is if you replace one over KI square by one divided by KI one plus epsilon, then still we get uh, Ackermannian upper and lower bounds. So that will be fine. Now let us switch slightly the bound. F of I is log of I divided by I. Then it turns out that the least MK for the bolzano weierstrass principle suddenly becomes uh, very concrete and it will be bounded by an exponential function. Now the question is, why is this the case? Well, in the beginning, I sketched the proof of bolzano weierstrass by a bisection argument. And the same argument works for finite numbers. So how is this possible? We fix M, let's say two to the K. And now uh, we look in the unit interval and we take uh, one side which contains more than half of the elements. So A1 is the half of the unit interval which contains not less than M over two elements. Then we go in I1 and take another half, which now contains one half of the previous elements. So M divided by four elements. And then we iterate. And we iterate this whole construction L times where L is capital K minus uh, binary log of K. Then what is the point? <clears throat> well, first of all, since we do bisection, the diameter of the interval i index l is one divided by two to the l. And uh, well, since we did this bisection, uh, the interval i l contains not less than m divided by two to the l many elements. And this is basically the number k. Okay. Now there are k elements left in the interval i l. We call them x k i. And then we see that for three elements in this interval, we have that the difference between two of them is bound by one divided by two to the L. This is less than equal to the log of M divided by M. And therefore for this function F bounded by F of XP. So we have this uh, bounding condition for this function and that's it. So finite combinatorics gives a nice simple upper bound for this bolzano weierstrass principle. And this time it is a rather concrete bound. Um, now the question is, what about uh, slight changes of the function f? So what about f of i is one over one divided by i, or f of i is one divided by i times the logarithm of i? And unfortunately, I don't know. But now I will somehow sketch what I know. And actually in the future, I want to solve this question where f of i is one over i, but it could be uh, that this, this uh, problem is very simple. So it could be that the first year's student would be able to solve it. It's not excluded, but uh, I tried hard and I did not uh, succeed. So, what I can show is if f of i is one over i, then the least mk in the bolzano weierstrass principle is bounded from below by an exponential function in k. That's fine. If f of i is one divided by i times log of i, then the least mk in the bolzano weierstrass principle is bounded from below by a double exponential function. And if f of i is one divided by i times log of i times log log of i, then mk is bounded below by a triple exponential function and it iterates. So if f of i is such a function where the d iterate of a log is showing up, then the least m of k in bwf and bolson weierstrass principle is bounded from below by a d plus one times iterated exponential function. Well, this is uh, already something, but uh, this is only for lower bounds. And I only know that the upper bounds are of this uh, uh, Ackermannian type, which is uh, very complex. So the question is, can we improve on the Ackermannian upper bounds? And this is what I don't know. 
Therefore, I switched the context and I go over to uh, the monotone convergence principle, monotone convergence principle, also in the Friedman style. So assume that uh, function f is strictly positive. Now the monotone convergence with respect to f is the following assertion. It's very similar to the bolzano weierstrass principle. The only difference is that we are now speaking about strictly increasing sequences of real numbers. So for all k, there exists a number m so big such that for all strictly increasing sequences, x1 smaller than x2 smaller than xm from the closed unit interval, there exists uh, finitely many numbers x k1 smaller than smaller than k index capital k below m such that we have this specific system of inequalities for all i less than equal to k minus two and the inequalities are x index k i plus one minus x k i plus two are bounded by f of k i and it's somehow important that the bigger indices are showing up in difference and the smaller index showing up over here. And it's also important that one has here ki and not i. So if one would just have here i instead of ki, the principle would be much, much weaker. Now, <clears throat> what's going to happen? Let f of i be one divided by i times log of i. Then the least mk in the monotone version Monotone conversion theorem is bounded from above by a double exponential function. Look, before I had uh, here bolzano weierstrass principle and a bound from below by a double exponential function, but now I switch the, the context. I switch from bolzano weierstrass to the monotone convergence theorem. And now I have bounded uh, boundings from below. No, no, bounding from above. Um, <clears throat> And if f of i is one divided by i times log of i to the one plus epsilon, then I can show that uh, the least mk in this monotone convergence theorem is uh, enormously big. So it's uh, Ackermannian, so it's non-primitive recursive. So it's beyond all iterations of exponential functions. So it's really very complex. What you also see here is uh, these are the functions showing up in the theorem by Abel. Uh -huh. And now we see a bit more. So let log d of i denote the dth iterate of log and let log star be the inverse of the tower function. So what does log star do? If we have a tower of exponentials, so two to the two to the two of height n, it uh, gives back uh, number n. Now, first of all, if f of i is a function of this type, <clears throat> then the least mk in this monotone convergence theorem is bounded by a d plus one times iterated exponential function. If I replace log d of i by log d of i to the one plus epsilon, then I jump to the Ackermannian case. So there's a big difference between iterated exponentials which are considered to be slow growing in this context and the very impressive, very growing Ackermann function. And you also see here, this is uh, somehow related to the theorem by Abel. You will see in a minute. Now go a bit further. Let f of i be one divided by i times log of i. And now this d here becomes depending on i. So you plug in here log star of i. So it's the best possible iterations this possible iteration which we can do until well until log star of i becomes uh, very small and then it turns out that the least mk in this monotone convergence principle is bounded by a tower function tower function is a function x goes to two to the two to the two and the tower of the exponential tower is height x and uh, this is an upper bound and for this, I use an extension of Abel's theorem by Jürgen Elsort, who has shown that this sum over here is divergent. Uh, the Ackermannian bound is difficult to prove, and I will not do this in this talk because uh, it's somewhat complicated. 
And if you have ever heard about the Paris Harrington principle, this type of combinatorics can be used to show an Ackermannian lower bound in this context. But now I will do one proof, namely I will show if I take f of i is one divided by i times log of i, y is the least mk in this monotone convergence principle bounded by a double exponential function. And the proof is elementary. So we take a m, a double exponential in k, and an arbitrary sequence in the unit interval. Now we look in a specific interval, I take a capital M, and then I take the, this interval, unit interval from zero one, and I come from the right to the left. So one minus one divided by M times log of M is left endpoint, and one is the rightmost endpoint. And I look whether there I can find K elements in this interval. If I can find K elements in this interval, well, then the distance between these elements is bounded by the length of the interval. So I get this inequality over here. And this means uh, I have shown uh, that uh, the, I found my K numbers. So that's fine. So this means uh, what happens if I do not find K elements with this property? If I don't find K last elements in the last interval, I find uh, many elements to the left. And uh, this is the next step. So I now look into the sequence. I look into the first M minus K elements and they're lying to the left of this endpoint. So R1 is the rightmost endpoint. And now I uh, make an iteration. So I take R1 and now I uh, take away one divided M minus K times log of M minus K. And again, I check whether there are K elements left in this interval. If so, then the differences are small and the inequality which I'm looking for is satisfied and we are done. And otherwise I uh, go further to the left. So now consider the first M minus K minus K elements. R2 is one minus the first endpoint minus the second endpoint. And uh, now if there are K elements left in this interval R2 and R2 minus this uh, number here, well then again, I have my nice inequality. And so we are done. Now the question is, does this process stop or does it go uh, through infinitely often. And the point is this process will stop after a finite amount of time. So we iterate this construction. If you can show that the RI finally leaves the unit interval on the leftmost side, then we are in one of the cases which, we are, which, which lead to the desired inequalities. And this is going to happen. The RI are going below zero at some moment. The point is uh, we take the differences <coughs> Uh, we, we look what is going to happen, how, may, how much space is left after we, we do all these constructions. And uh, then we take the leftmost endpoint and we subtract uh, these uh, the sums of the lengths of the intervals. And then we see, ah, yeah, this sum can be calculated. So this number hits zero because, well, we estimate the sum and, and this this sum over here is one divided, basically one divided by K, and then the sum over this one. Now we see is one divided by K times the integral along one divided by X times log of X, which is one divided by K times log of log of M. Voila, and log of log of M is basically K, and then we have one, and one minus one is finally a zero. So that's fine, and that's the proof. And here you see basically why these Abel integrals are showing up. Because the divergence of this Abel integral guarantees that this interval type construction is terminating. Okay, uh, now what is the uh, uh, idea? We can uh, generalize this. And if you take differences of branches of Ackermann functions, then uh, it turns out that the least mk in this monotone convergence principle is bounded by a sort of primitive recursive function. And this argument, which I just gave for the double exponential function also works when one takes these differences of inverses of the Ackermannian functions using a certain telescoping uh, 
telescoping some argument, which I will not explain in more detail. And the conjecture is that uh, these functions FD are precisely the ones which lead to the phase transition in this monotone convergence principle. So if I replace the in inverses of the branches of the Ackermann function by the full Ackermann function, then somehow uh, the idea is that one might get non-primitive recursive bounds. So that's my conjecture, but this is not yet proved. Now, what is this? The difference between these Ackermannian type functions? Um, that's difficult to say. Moreover, the question is, could also be, what is a derivative? So Banessi is these uh, concrete functions, these discrete functions, but when can somehow define what is the sort of analytic continuation of these functions, or at least a sort of smooth uh, interpolation on the real line, and one can look at what is the formal derivative of those functions. And this is an interesting question. Now, the following theorem comes out. So log D is a default iteration of log. Log star is the inverse of the tower function. Then uh, it turns out that this integral or this infinite sum is converging. And well, look, this is basically the result by Elstrad, but here's a new factor log star of x. This makes it uh, still divergent. But if I have log star of x to the one plus epsilon, it becomes suddenly converging. Now one can iterate this. Namely, uh, one takes the terms which we have seen before, but now one does further iterations. So log star of x, log of log star of x, log log of log star of x, and when it's a sort of more generalized version of this Abel integral, and still it becomes divergent. If the last term is uh, taken to the one plus epsilon, it suddenly becomes convergent. So we see here a new theorem about uh, the slow diverging, slowly diverging integrals and slowly converging integrals, and they are finer than in the original version by Abel. Now, the conjecture is if I have one of those functions, we're finally there as a one plus epsilon, and then these bounds mk for the monotone convergence principle, this bound mk is Ackermannian if and only if this epsilon is bigger than zero. So it's somehow a nice phase transition, but I have not fully proved it yet. Next theorem is again, we have uh, these functions, log star is the inverse of the tower function. Now log star index D is a default iteration of log star. Well, you can form even more complex integrals by iterations of uh, the log star function. And again, you get the refinement of the Abel theorem. So if you do it D many times, you get a divergent integral. If you plug uh, a one plus epsilon into the last term, you get a conversion integral. You can even make this D depending on I, and then we have a log star function, uh, well, we have a log double star function, so to say, and uh, it still seems to go through. And in fact, it seems that uh, by this type of construction, one can define new classes of functions where these integrals or infinite sums are converging or diverging, and one gets finer and finer uh, uh, thresholds. And these functions showing up over here, the integrants, they will be more or less good approximations for what is uh, the derivative of the inverse of the Ackermann function. And for epsilon equal to zero, I hope, or being able to show that I obtain primitive recursive bounds for the monotone convergence principle. And for epsilon bigger than zero, I assume non-primitive recursive bounds. Unfortunately, uh, the separation is good for the monotone case, but not for the non-monotone case. So what is our result? If f of i is this form, then I get Ackermannian uh, lower bounds for the monotone case and also for the non-monotone case. And for the non-monotone case, if I've 
this function f of i, then I have primitive recursive upper bounds for m of k. But uh, some of these functions uh, they don't fit so well together. So there's a huge gap uh, in between. Somehow, I believe if I take this function and replace the deep branch of the Ackermann function by the full Ackermann function, and then it's functional inverse, this will be the, uh, the best possible three short for this uh, non monotone Bolzano Weierstrass principle. Harvey Friedman has all the miniaturizations of the Bolzano Weierstrass principle, which is not provable in first order arithmetic. But as I said, this talk is not about logic, so I will not uh, describe this in more detail. But there uh, is a so, sort of more complex situation of finding out more finer versions of the Bolzano Weierstrass principle. And for those ones, it should be possible also to obtain um, interesting three shots. And what is needed over there is a sort of transfinite extension of the definition of the Ackermann function. But this is well studied in logic. I will not uh, go into the details here. And then I have to study the functional inverses of these and it's somehow fine. But of course, uh, I will not go into these details here. And that's the end. So a bit of mathematics in Ghent. So students, PhD students and postdocs are welcome. There's a nice page, research at ugent.be, and there you can find uh, funding options. And here you see on the last slide uh, our logic group in Ghent. And uh, so you're welcome if you're interested in logic. And if you're interested in PDEs, of course, you are welcome in the group of Michael. So that's my talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We are now open to questions. If anybody wants to, to make a question for professor, go ahead. Okay, if not, I, I have a question. Uh, professor, yeah. I, I want to know if, if is it possible to, to join some of your research with, with quantum computing in order to, for example, have a better known of this Ackerman functions or, or something like that. Because because you mentioned that that computers cannot um, calculate that Ackerman functions, right? Yes. But mm -hmm. I don't know with with, con, with quantum computers uh, could be possible something. Yes, yeah, this is a very good question. But uh, these Ackerman functions uh, are just about the limitations of the real world. So the function values are just so big that uh, you cannot physically realize them. So the numbers are much, much bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So even a quantum computer will not help you in, in calculating the values. It is just uh, a theoretical. So the point is you can define numbers. You can say the, they are existing, but you are never able to write these numbers on a sheet of paper in the decimal expansion. It's just you would need too much space for it. But they are still fine, so these numbers exist. And the Ackermann function is somehow a paradigm in computer science for uh, complexity considerations, but usually for the non-feasible complexity classes. OK, OK, thank you. And OK, professor, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. And thank you for accepting our invitation again. I hope you can enjoy the rest of the event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. And it was a pleasure for me to be in. And uh, yeah. Okay, whatever. okay, next talk is in charge of Jessica. You can go ahead. Hi. Okay. Palet, Professor Palet, are you over there? Let's wait a moment, some minutes more for Palette. Hi. <laughs> Let me one moment, I will help you. Uh, you mute.
Now okay, you're. I... Mm -hmm. It seems it works. Yes. I will try to share my screen. Uh, sharing options. Okay. Uh, Okay, I think you see. Yes. Yes, that is perfect. So let's uh, wait only a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. So before the talk started, I will make the introduction for, for you. And I will say something, I will say in English, and I also want to share in Spanish part of that. <laughs> for, for the uh, Latin American people that is here. So for this last talk uh, on this event, for me, it's a pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor Pahlev. Um, uh, he born in one of the oldest cities in Europe. Yeah, I, I have been reading about that. <laughs> in Churreskat Mitrovica in Serbia. But he is currently sitting in Berlin. Uh, that is also having uh, uh, been uh, good for me, <laughs> learning about learning with he, mathematics in my master, okay? Um, para los que no saben, eh, Renska Mitrovica es una de las ciudades más viejas de Europa y um, el profesor es de esa ciudad, eh, es, es en Serbia, pero pues él actualmente está en Berlín viviendo y está eh, radicado en Alemania. Um, this uh, Serbian prodigious, prodigious mathematician is, is a completely product of the Serbian Mathematics Society uh, because he got his master's degree and he got his PhD in the same university that is uh, Belgrade University. And also he was teaching in that university and he was researching in that university. And at the same time when he was doing this kind of uh, um, studies. He also uh, researched in the Serbian Academy of Science and Art, the Mathematical Institute of Serbian Academy of Science and Art uh, in, Bel in Belgrade. And I want to say that this uh, academy, is, this institute is very important because um, it was found in 
in the in 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 the country when they were devastated for the war. So that give us a really um, a example of how um, mathematicians can do an apport in science, even in even in 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 bad um, um, moments for the society. You know, um, el 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 es completamente un producto de de la sociedad eh, serbia. Estudió completamente en la Universidad del Belgrado y eh, investigó allá, fue su profesor allá y también eh, investigó, eh, sigue investigando y es profesor asociado de la, del Instituto de Matemáticas de eh, Serbia, eh, de Academia de la Serbia, de Ciencias de Académicas de la Serbia y en Artes. Y este lugar es muy importante porque fue fundado en un país eh, cuando el país estaba recién saliendo de la guerra, ¿sí? Palet, as he like to be called, because in 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 Latin America we have this kind of uh, um, detailed teaching all the time, professor, professor or teacher. Um, he is currently working in Freie University, that is one of the most important university that Germany has. Moment, I need to be, be more <laughs> participation. And now you can imagine that kind of level that he was called for Germany to work in here. However, he continued working for the Mathematical Institute of Serbian Academy and uh, the Science and Arts. His areas of specialization are discrete geometry and a cross broad between algebraic topology and geometry combinatory. He is also uh, well known for uh, his work in optimal in the optimal color uh, Tevergit theorem and Nadam Muka and Radam and Rap problems <laughs> and on his study of configuration spaces and solution uh, of extent value conjecture. Su área de especialización es geometría discreta y un mix entre topología algebraica y geometría combinatoria. Y él es súper, hiper, mega conocido por eh, un teorema súper importante que es el, eh, el, 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 el teorema de Tenberger. El, de Tenberger, ¿ok? Eh, now, in my experience, um, you know that uh, we have a problem. Eh, with mathematics, that is um, finding a good researcher and a good teacher. And um, I can I can say that Professor Palev has these two <laughs> qualities <laughs> uh, because um, I have been taking some courses con he, with him and I know that um, he is a really good teacher and he's a really good researcher. And today he will show us how we can be creative, connecting ideas, a method between different math fields and using create using this creativity in a Howard glass. Yes, a Howard glass. So let's continue. Él nos va a presentar hoy. Eh, es extremadamente creativo. A él le gusta conectar las eh, ideas y los métodos y va a explicar cómo estos cómo estos campos se pueden mezclar aplicando topología en el en 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 el hourglass es el reloj de tiempo. Listo, entonces, go ahead, pass left. Now you can start to talk. Uh, it is really a pleasure to be uh, with you today. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you very much, Jessica, for the invitation. It is really a great honor to talk today to you. This is, since this is the last talk of the day, I will try to start very relaxing and share my view of basically research I like. And please be free to stop me at any time when you feel something is not clear. So I will talk about configuration spaces and I like to share with you my picture, how I like to see a bunch of open problems and methods how to solve them. And this is what I call uh, configuration spaces in an hour glass. So this talk will talk uh, is based on my joint multiple joint projects with my closest mathematical family. Uh, this includes Frederick Cohen, 
Michael Crabb, Wolfgang Lick, and Ginter Ziegler. Unfortunately, Fred Cohen passed away at uh, the beginning of this year, the, maybe a week after our book was finally published. And this talk, in some sense, is dedicated to memory of really a great mathematician and amazing human being. OK, so I want to tell you first what's a configuration space. It's very important to explain what's the title. And so that's the first goal of this talk, to explain what's in the title. So I give you a topological space, and I place on the topological space and you can always think ants or points, and you don't allow these points to go one on top of another. What I'm talking about is and pairwise distinct point, but ordered. Okay. And then maybe a decent example would be helpful. And you could say, okay, let's maybe start with the line. And if I take a line and the simplest case, it's n equal two, and I'm in the plane, and I'm looking at all pairs of distinct points. So this means I deleted diagonal x equal to y. And so what I'm talking about is really a disjoint union of two open half spaces. Okay, this is relatively simple. If you are topologist, this is just two points. And then you can say, okay, what are you doing? Maybe I put more points to the play. If I take still the line and take n big or equal to n two, then I actually get r to the n minus some union of linear arrangements, linear subspaces. And in the end, there are n factorial connected components. So basically I am talking at the moment about n factorial points, disjoint, not touching each other, which means it's not so interesting, but uh, I'm cheating a little bit saying this is uh, one of the most well-studied objects in algebraic topology, because usually in topological space, you take Euclidean space of a higher dimension, or you take a manifold, compact, open, compact with a boundary, and everything is interesting to understand. So at the beginning, I'll tell you something about the history. Uh, before history, I should put one more ingredient in play. Let's notice when I have n pairwise distinct points, I can always act by, uh, with a symmetry group in the following way. So if I have a permutation, I can just permute my points as a want by the rule of the permutation. In this way, instead of looking at the ordered n tuples of pairwise distinct points, I could look at the subsets of x of cardinality exactly n. And this is called unordered configuration space, while the first one we called ordered configuration space. So we have two spaces which we want to study. The reasons why we want to study it will be apparent eventually. Okay. So the history of the study of configuration space starts by a uh, work, seminal work of Rartin from 1925, where he introduced uh, so-called geometric braids in the modern language. And looking at the geometric braids, which are here just illustrated up to a homotopy, he introduced the operation of concatenation on such braids and define a, a group BN of all homotopy classes of geometric braids. Operation on this uh, group were just concatenation of braids. If you have a braid, here we have only one twisting, and we add maybe the same braid, then the new braid is just the one where you forget that you concatenated at all. In this way, he got a group and the most situated result from him is presentation of this group in the following form. So you have n minus one generators, if you have n braids and the generators are given as follows, here's sigma one where you intertwine i and i plus one braid and the relations between them which define uh, up to homotopy give you commutativity when these braids i and i uh, and j are far away or 
there is this special relation when they are close enough. The next stop in the study of uh, configuration spaces comes with Edward Fadell and New, uh, Lynn Nurit, and also uh, the name of configuration space is born by the uh, work. They proved one of the major results of this study was a so-called fundamental vibrations. For vibration, let me just tell you what it is. If you have a manifold, when I say manifold, I mean a topological connected manifold of dimension at least two. And I fix or by QM denote M points in M. So just cardinality M. And I introduce for the convenience of uh, this slide, F M of the N to be just configuration space of M without the, I deleted M point, and then I take pairwise distinct and pairwise distinct points. So what I'm talking about is, for example, a sphere. This is at least two sphere S two. I fixed, deleted M points, and then inside that I look for additional and pairwise distinct points. Now I note, uh, they noticed that a projection, any projection for any R between one and N minus one by forgetting everything after R is just a vibration. This allowed them to compute multiple result of the homotopy type of uh, configuration space, for example, of a sphere and other manifolds. Yet the same year, now, in the different combination, Ralph Fox and Nurit aimed to give a direct presentation from the study of the fundamental group of the configuration space uh, and retrieve the Artin's presentation of the Bray group. And that was the next major step. This was obtained by constructing a CW model for the unordered configuration space and using the technique of computing homotopy groups when you have a configuration space from which you delete certain cells. Next major step in the history of study of configuration spaces goes to Vladimir Igorovich Arnold, who computed, among other things, I'm just picking one interest, important result, a cohomology of the plane configuration space with coefficients in integers. He proved that this is an exterior algebra over Z generated by omega i j. Basically, for every diagonal, you have one generator, and the ideal you need to quotient by is given by these relations. The result was obtained really by a masterful use of the Serre spectral sequence, and the major uh, contribution to this, according to Arnold's, was. Uh, made by Dmitri Fuchs. Going a few decades further, at least five uh, to six years, Frederick Cohen first announced in Bulletin of Mathematical Society in the paper by name uh, Cohomology of Braid Spaces and sequence of results, which came to surface in 1976 in a seminal uh, work. Uh, this is Springer Lecture Notes in Mathematics 533. Art authors were Cohen, May, and Lada, where they computed a lot of things. And the major objective is to compute homology of iterated loop spaces. And one of the technical highlights of Cohen's contributions was the Cohen vanishing theorem, where he completely described the spectral sequence associated to this uh, vibration. So we have configuration space on P uh, particles, where P is a prime. We look at its Borel construction and associated vibration, and now fiber is a configuration space. And to every vibration, you have associated spectral sequence, and he completely described it. And the shape of the spectral sequence is pictured here, where these are zeros. This is a cohomology of the cyclic group. Again, cohomology of cyclic group twisted with certain coefficients. And here we only have invariance. Everything else 
is zero. And he proved that only one differential is non-zero and all the rest which can come from different uh, rows vanish, the vanishing theorem. For me, this was absolute surprise when I found out this result in this in a very obscure, really lecture notes from 76. And this result solved a problem which you will see further on in the lecture in one stroke. So yet in 1988, a completely new contribution comes from Carl Friedrich Bodeheimer, Cohen and Larry Taylor, Lawrence Taylor. They computed now homology, please be aware, of unordered configuration space. So these are subsets for manifold M. Here manifold means smooth, compact, connected, and of dimension at least two. And in order to put on the slide, at least so you see how it looks like, I will tell you what is a homology, I homology of the unordered configuration space of n particles with coefficients in the field with two elements. And if you were just, you might be quizzed, uh, I said they proved for smooth compact connected manifolds. Well, RD is smooth. Yes, connected, but it's not compact. Well, this is the result already due to Fred Cohen from this uh, lecture note from 76, but this is the only result which can be somehow written on the slide. And it says that this is a vector space over the field F2 generated by monomials of degree, certain degree, certain weight inside the algebra which has generators UL or dimension L and all these are called iterated dilation homology operation acting on this U alpha. So what's happening is that you have a certain algebra which is generated by so-called iterated dilation operations. And inside this algebra, you have algebraic filtration by weight and by degree. And then inside this algebra, you pick vector subspaces uh, to get eight homology or certain homology or certain configuration space. What is amazing is that in this description, this N tells you weight, but you can put here N prime, change here N prime, and still algebra will be the same. Meaning this algebra contain all homologies of all configuration spaces into one stroke. Okay. Now maybe to tell you something about a hourglass, how I like to think about this area and the problems inside. And this picture contains a lot of open problems. Some of them are solved in certain situations. And I will try to share with you my glimpse of uh, these problems and connection between them. Because in my belief, mathematics is always about connections, not always about results. And realizing this connection and using them efficiently, we can really uh, solve many problems without even taking a serious sweat. Okay. So in this picture, as a hourglass, I like to think that on the top of the hourglass, I put a collection of problems. At the moment, I put a collection of problems about embeddings. These are classical problems of embeddings and immersions. Now these are generalization, K immersion, K regular maps, K skew maps, or K skew embeddings are uh, K regular L skew joined together and you want to study them. All these problems at one stroke. On the bottom, I have a measure partition problem, the so-called Greenberg or Hadwiger Ramos problem, where the ham sandwich uh, result is a first instance of this problem. The next problem below is cohomology of unordered Grassmannian. And this is sitting here. And amazingly, uh, the result of Borel from the mid uh, 20th century computed cohomology, real co uh, cohomology of the real Grassmannian with F2 coefficients. If you just drop this line and put oriented, that's a completely open problem. 
Then there is a counting of periodic billiard trajectories in a convex billiard. You are playing a billiard and you want to estimate how many periodic billiard trajectories you can get of a given cardinality. So how many time, how many trajectories you have such that it bounces five times, 10 times, 100 times. Can you say something about it? But you don't know absolutely nothing about your table. You only know it's a convex body such that on the boundary, there is no line. So you cannot bounce on the boundary. Nanda Kumara Manara, a problem, we will get to it in more detail. So I will not tell you what it is at the moment. McPherson's conjecture uh, is a famous conjecture with a really uh, controversial history. Uh, McPherson defined a partially ordered set and conjectured that its ordered complex is actually homotopy equivalent to the real Grossmannian. Uh, supposed solution was published in Annals, and uh, maybe a decade later it was retrieved because of an obvious and really trivial mistake. So this is an example of a mathematical work which was completely wrong and was published in the most prestigious journal. So the conjecture is still open. Then there is a Smale's topological complexity of algorithm. Uh, Smale introduced a notion of topological complexity of an algorithm where he wanted to compute the maximal numbers of branching in algorithms for a given task, minimizing over all possible algorithms. And it turned out that you can really connect this to the topology of the configuration space. And finally, on this bottom row, you have an optimal color turbo theorem, which comes from a discrete geometry and was uh, proposed by Baranil Larman. And here you have a Baranil Larman conjecture. What are the connections? Well, here are the connections. In this picture, I didn't explain deliberately. This is a neck of my hourglass. And my idea and proposal is that we always look at our problem. We transform them and we come into the neck with a bunch of really open problem and connections and understanding these connections, if we understand them well, by solving, for example, and this is the standing problem here, we can bounce back and solve problems on the different sides. As you can see to this box, yellow box, we have the most connections. Okay, today I will share with you uh, one walk along the hourglass. And the idea is to tell you about two problems. I will start with the K-regular embeddings, a question that actually Borsuk in 1956 proposed. I will translate it here. Then I will take another Kumaramana problem, translate it in this neck, and then I will connect them. Solving after connection topologically induced problem, I will solve both of them in one stroke. Now, let me tell you something about a problem of K-regular embeddings, and we can, for a moment, forget about everything I said so far. So in Borsuk, in 1957, I'm sorry, asked the following question, or first introduced the notion. So he fixed the integer K. K equal to 1 does not really sound well. We will see in a second. And we take N also to be an integer. And for topological space X, we say that the map is K-regular, if for every collection of K pairwise distinct points, the span of the F of X1, F of XK is exactly K. In other words, K distinct points give me K linearly independent vectors for every collection of K points. What is the question? Well, maybe before the question, a few examples. If you have a map, from R to RK given in the following way, it is K regular. And we can actually prove it rather easily. If you take K distinct point right down the matrix, you get a famous Van der Mond, uh, the, uh, matrix whose determinant is different from zero if and only if all the entries are different from zero. So just from linear algebra, we know, we already know one K regular map. The same argument give us a K regular map from complex numbers 
to the product of R and C K minus one. Just commenting back about K equal one, what does this mean to be one regular? This means whenever I take a point, one point here that the vector whose image I evaluate at this point should be linearly independent, which means just different from zero. So being one regular means avoid zero, okay? Now, the question, the simplest question we can phrase is the following. Find the number n dk, which is a minimal n, such that there exists a k regular map from Rd to Rn. Fair enough. So if I take Rd, Euclidean space, and I can place it in a huge Euclidean space, of course, it's going to be k regular. It's not even hard to construct some general uh, position argument, but how much I can go down? That's the question. And now I will try to solve it. So as we have k is at least one, d is at least one, and n is at least one. And let me assume that I have a k regular map from Rd to Rn. And by definition, this means if I take k pairwise distinct points, here are they x1 to xk in Rd and map them. Now all together, I should get a k frame, meaning being linearly independent. This means I will land in the Stiefel manifold of k frames of Rn. In this case, I'm talking about Stiefel manifold of or, uh, affine frames. I could also forward this uh, using the Milner's notation, Milner's Tasha notation to orthonormal frames, but I don't care in principle. They are homotopy equivalent. Okay. Moreover, if in this map I permute the points x1 to the x case, you remember the action on the configuration space, and then I permuted these images. This means that if I take my action already introduced here and define action on the Stiefel manifold by permuting uh, the vectors by a permutation, this map I have defined is sigma k equivariant. Now, if I can prove that such a map does not exist for given d, k, and n, then I know that there is no k regular map. A beautiful lemma of um, Frederick Cohen and Handel tells me then instead of asking for the existence of this equivalent map, I can translate this question about in the question about vector bundles. And for that one, I consider the following vector bundle. I take my configuration space, forget about this portioning for a moment and multiply for R with R to the K. This means I take my K pairwise distinct points and to every point I associate a real number, maybe a color of the hair of my point. Now I just portioned this by Sigma K and I get a new space. Well, this space is actually vibration vector bundle with a fiber R to the K. And the fact that if there exists an equivariant map, this is completely equivalent to the question of, uh, to the fact of admitting that my uh, vector bundle Xi admits an N minus K dimensional inverse. What does this mean? Well, there exists a bundle eta over the same space uh, such that sigma plus n, uh, psi plus n is isomorphic to a trivial bundle of dimension in this case, n. I underline just saying that it's a bundle. So if this equivariant map exists, it exists if and only if this vector bundle has such an inverse. Being algebraic topologist, I know immediately I have a tool in my hand and say, okay, if my bundle has an inverse of a certain dimension, so if psi, as I said, plus n is trivial and dimension of psi is n minus k, this means that the stiefel whitney class of this bundle eta is zero 
for all i bigger than n minus k. So if I prove that the inverse bundle or a dual Stifler Witten class, what is a Stifler Witten class of the inverse bundle? In this case, this is the same as Stifler Witten class of the inverse bundle. This is by definition. Then I prove that there is no sigma, uh, there is no k regular embedding. So suddenly, existence of a bed, an embedding is completely related to calculation of the dual Stifler-Witten class of some specific vector bundle. So I looked at my Hauer glass, I took my problem and I slowly went to this picture and my Stifler-Witten class lives in the cohomology of the unordered configuration space. You see, this is the bundle and Stifler-Witten classes always live in the cohomology of the base space with a, a coefficients in the field of two elements. So this was my first dive. And now I will start moving upwards. Okay, here's the problem. Nanda Kumar and Ramana Rao, just say, uh, to know, are uh, not really mathematicians, are uh, really uh, two mathematical enthusiasts who proposed this problem in 2006, tried to solve it and they didn't manage. And it turned out that even today, many cases are completely open. And typically I talk about this problem, but for this uh, occasion, I changed my completely approach. So if somebody heard this, it's, this is completely new. But let me just tell you what is the problem. If I am in the plane, I call a collection of convex sets P1 to the PK convex with the non-empty interior, a convex partition if the union is everything. Partition typically means that the elements in the partition are pairwise disjoint. Here, this is not the case, but it's almost the case. I ask that the union of all intersections have area zero, okay? So they cannot touch by uh, along something that has a positive area. So that's a convex partition of a plane. And now the question is the following. Is it true that for every convex body, convex body is a convex uh, compact set in RD. And let me add uh, uh, with non-empty interior so we don't uh, get into a problem. Uh, and every k an integer, there exists a convex partition in k pieces of R2, such that when you take this partition and intersect with C, all the areas is, are the same, but not only the areas, also perimeters are the same. Okay, that's the question. And you can say, okay, this sounds rather easy. Let's try an example as usual. We try always something to do. And so here's my convex body. And I will take the case maybe k equal two. This is re relatively simple. And here's an idea. I will take a direction unit vector in the plane. And in this direction, I will find a unique line which cuts my convex body, in this case, triangle in two pieces of equal area. And then I will compute the perimeter on one side perimeter of the other side and subtract, okay? Then I will turn. And at one point I will come to the antipodal vector. And now my function that I have evaluated changed sign because I was always subtracting the perimeter on the positive side where my vector looks minus the one on the opposite side. Now the size changed places. And so the value that which I had for function here is the same here. Assuming that the function, and that was the reason to take the convex body is continuous, I moved from one point to another and I changed signs. So this means in particular, if I look at the angle of the vector as my domain that I, by intermediate value theorem, I hit zero somewhere. So perimeters, the difference is zero, perimeters on left and right-hand side 
are the same. And then you say, okay, this sounds really easy. What do I do in the case n equals three? And it turns out that from that point on, it's unclear how to proceed. Now, the, uh, the best result is that we know that this is true when k is a power of prime. Today, I will go for one solution, not a standard one, uh, in the case when k is a power of two, power of a prime, yes. And that should have a solution. So let me try to solve it. I just explained how I solve it for k equal two. And I'm so much out of time, I'm sorry. And I look at one direction and cut into the half such that area on the left and right hand side are the same. This means for every vector, I have two values of perimeter of left and right hand side. And let's continue. I have first cut into the half, then with Two more vectors, I cut each of the sides into half and evaluate now four different values. Let's continue. I do this now in each of the pieces, I cut again into half. Now I have one plus two plus four spheres. Now in R to the eight. Altogether, I get a map from S1 to the two to the M minus one, which is k minus one to r to the k. And what I want is that at some point, all of them are equal, that I hit equality, okay? What is a actually advantage of this story? Well, advantage of this story is that if you change orientation of this map I have defined, there is and interchange in these coordinates. Now here, the action of the group is not so easy anymore. And the group becomes a Ruth product of Z2 and Z2. And you have the action accordingly defined. In particular, this is a dihedral group D8. If you continue, you have more Ruth products. And in general, you have M fold Ruth product of Z2. What did we get? we have a map from S1 to the K minus one to R to the K. This is equivalent with respect to the group real product of Z2s. And we would like to prove that each map of this sort must hit here diagonal, that all values are the same. And suddenly this question can be again translated into the question about vector bundles. What is the vector bundle about? Like in the previous case, I take my space of all cuts. Now this is a product of spheres, multiply with R to the K, where I evaluate my values. All this uh, when quotienting by a group action gives me a bundle. I'm deliberately abusing notation and taking psi for everything that matters, okay? And then I noticed that in this vector bundle, there is a trivial bundle where all the values are the same. So it decomposes where the, ve and the vector bundle eta is here. Okay, each of these equivalent maps defines a section. And what I want to prove is that each section hits diagonal, which means each section in eta hits zero. And again, in order to prove this, it suffices to prove that the Stiefel Whitney class, which in this case is the other class of dimension k minus one is non zero. And if I can prove this, I solved my Nandakruma Ramana Rao problem for k equal to, to the m. So, two problems, two vector bundles. Is there a connection? So, we are here. But moving from Nandakruma Ramana Rao, I didn't get the configuration space. I get the product of spheres. So, and now I have a dream that I do have one vector bundle here that we had before. And this is a vector bundle here, but there is no connection. I would love to have a connection. So what I would love to have is a map here and map there, such that this diagram is a pullback diagram. Why? Because then the characteristic classes just pull back backwards, but that's not enough. If 
if I have here a characteristic class along the Mac backwards, it can die. My second dream is that this map IK star in cohomology is injective. And now I will just briefly tell you what's the map. First, we will define a map from SD, I deliberately generalized D minus one to K minus one to the configuration space. An idea the, uh, which I will present is called Ptolemaic epicycle, a very nice geometric idea. And I start with the pictures in the plane for K equal to, I want to embed a sphere S1 into the configuration space F uh, R2. Two, what I am doing, here's my sphere, here's my point, I embed it into the pair X minus X and they are definitely different. What do I do when I have K equal four? Now I have three spheres, three points on the sphere. Now the first one tells me on the big circle where my centers of new smaller circles will be, here they are. And then the points Z goes there into minus Z and Y goes to Y and minus one. And here's the map. And then I notice that this map is only equivariant with respect to this group. Here I have a symmetric group action, but also the action of Z to breathe M times because M is K is M to the two to the K. Okay, still I'm not with I to the K. This is what I want. What do I get? Well, so far I have this one. Let's quotient it. Okay, that's the map, fine. Action on the both sides. And now I can quotient with a bigger group, Sigma K. And the map here is just a covering map. And in particular, since this is a silo subgroup, the index is relatively prime to two. Then, my aim and a hope is this, that this is injective. This is fairly easy to prove that it is injective. And this question is actually the most important one. Okay, since my time is almost over, I will just tell you, yes, why this picture is nice. Well, cohomology of this space can be calculated. And we have a result. This is a polynomial algebra on M generators quotient by an ideal plus one additional ideal. This is additive decomposition, not algebra decomposition. Generators are of degree two to the R minus one. And moreover, the stiefel witten classes I wanted to compute and you will find on the previous slides can be evaluated and it is a product of all these generators to the power of D minus one. Since we are quotient all the powers above D, we know that this is not zero. And so we obtained solution from the, the Kumara Manarao problem. And since this is the map that it is injective, we also know that this stiefel witten class, which we calculated here is not zero in this model. Uh, about K regular maps. Now we not want to understand what is the inverse bundle and what is a, a stiefel witten class dual of our Xi. The general formula is you just take the sum of the power series. You can decompose this into two terms, A and B, where the A belongs to this part of the direct sum and B is inside. And this part we pretty much well know, and we can understand what stiefel witten classes live here. And in particular, the stiefel witten classes which live here are dimension two to the M minus, two to the M minus one until two to the M minus one. These are so-called Dixon elements. So study of the dual stiefel witten class of the bundle Xi, boils down to understanding how Dixon elements are multiplied in this term and evaluating such an ST uh, power series and hoping to find in this part A something that's non-zero. 
part E, B at the moment is completely untouchable. The details of these calculations to the, with all details can be found in Springer Lecture Notes 2282 and uh, contain all the details and the background material. So almost on time, we are back to our hourglass. And what did we do today? We looked at a bunch of problems. This one look almost the same, have embedding in uh, the ending of the problem. While these ones are of completely different uh, style and coming from different areas asked by different people, attacked by different methods, all of them are connected to a diagram in my hourglass in the neck and understanding connections in this particular case. This connection helped us to say something about K-regular maps and on the Kumaramana Rao problem. And what I didn't emphasize and I should have is that now we have some description of the cohomology of unordered configuration space inside algebra to which we have some control. And yeah, maybe I will stop here. Thank you very much. Has someone some questions for Palif? Okay, no. Um, thank you, teacher, for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, <laughs> like, like, like we have been seeing in some of the seminars, um, this Bursuk theorem is very important and sometimes get us uh, a lot of connections. How, how, how did you yeah. see uh, the connection with the Bursuk uh, theorem in, in this particular part? So uh, Borsuk one theorem we used already here in a very hidden way when I solved the Nanda Kumar Ramana Rao problem for k equal two, I used the intermediate value theorem, which is really a Borsuk one theorem in dimension if you want one or zero. Uh, if you generalize the problem here of the Nanda Kumar Ramana not to the plane, to arbitrary dimension, you can ask, okay, I have a convex body. I want to cut into two pieces of equal volume, but I'm given additional uh, D minus one functions and I want them to equalize. So not only perimeter. And then you use a borsal theorem to get it. Uh, one observation is that if instead of the functions, you take just the measures, you say, I take D measures and I want to cut into arbitrary now n pieces and n does not have any more to be a, a power of prime. We can do it because we can first cut it into first power of prime pieces, then continue cutting because additivity or measures allow us to cut into iteratively one after another. But if you have a perimeter, which is not a measure, the problem is completely open. There was uh, there is a paper which supposedly solved completely the problem, but unfortunately we found out that the result is not true. Unfortunately, the topological result behind the claim does not hold. We proved that corresponding accurate maps do exist. So mm -hmm. in all these stories, first of all, this one is connected to the existence of a current map. This map to the existence of the inverse. Immersion conjecture also talk about existence of the uh, inverse of a particular vector bundle, in this case, tangent bundle and its inverse in a certain dimension. So all these uh, fun, uh, problems have the same flavor, just the ambient is uh, different. And this is one of the major highlights of algebraic topology of 80 solution of the immersion conjecture. And already for these cases, we cannot do much more uh, behind uh, be just Euclidean space. Uh, the results for construction of K regular map goes to algebraic geometry and group of, of, of authors from Poland uh, led by Tadeusz Januszkiewicz. So interplay here on the K regular level comes algebraic topology. This is 
uh, related to uh, numerical approximation and for construction, you use heavy machinery for from algebraic geometry. How do you find? Well, you need to be old enough, it seems, at least for me. <laughs> ah, okay, I'm thank sorry. you. I, I don't have a reasonable answer. <laughs> okay, no, thank you so much for your talk. No mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting. This is really a nice occasion. No, we are so happy to have you here. And um, yeah, and thank you to closed the event today. And I hope <laughs> that you are not so cold. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Eh, bueno, una última cosa. Recuerde que mañana las charlas inician a las 8 de la mañana, ahora Colombia. Eh, pues fue un buen día y pues nos vemos mañana. Estén pendientes al al link de Zoom, que es diferente para cada día. Y muchas gracias a todos por asistir hoy. Okay. Jessica, ¿quieres decir eso en inglés? Sí. Remember that we have our last day tomorrow. Tomorrow we will start at 8 a.m. Colombian hour. That means that it's 3 p.m. In, in Europe. And um, each day have different links. And then check well, your link for tomorrow. Yep. And then see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye, bye, everyone.